Um, Ranthis is on his way. He sent me a message that he's a, a little bit delayed in traffic, but should be here shortly. And um, Shanice is excused from this meeting. She was unable to make it. Um, just as a reminder for the audience and for the committee members and for staff um, that the Portland Clean Energy Fund was created by local ballot measure 26201, which was passed by Portland voters in November of 2018. The ballot initiative was led by communities of color in a coalition with labor, environmental groups, progressive businesses, and countless others. The initiative, and now a city program, is the first of its kind nationally and globally and is designed to invest 54 to $71 million annually in clean energy, climate action, and green careers for all Portlanders, but especially those who have not historically seen benefits from green investments. The fund will ensure that Portland's climate action plan is implemented in a manner that supports social, economic, and environmental benefits for all Portlanders. We're just going to be making that kind of little announcement and reminder of the thing that we're doing here and why we're gathered and kind of our purpose at the beginning of all of the meetings um, for, for all of us as staff, you as committee members, and then also to kind of orient folks in the audience. Tonight, we wanted to start a new tradition um, with, by starting each meeting with a couple of minutes of opening inspiration. James brought this idea forward to us. Uh, we all thought it was great and offered to provide the first, um, the first of this opening inspiration, just a couple minutes. We can rotate these around to staff, um, but would also like to invite committee members to, if you are interested in kind of providing this opening inspiration at the beginning of meetings, to please email and we can kind of get you scheduled into a slot um, to do that. All right. Yeah. Um, so as Katie mentioned, uh, yeah, this is a new practice that we're starting for opening uh, these meetings. And I reached out. Uh, we're here at Teatro Milagro uh, community space and uh, Latinx focused uh, organization uh, for theater and performance. So I thought it would be appropriate uh, to have a reading uh, that is in that spirit. And I reached out to a local poet uh, who's um, Latino. He's an indigenous immigrant and member of the uh, Mistec Nation from Oaxaca, Mexico, um, and reached out to him for a poem that uh, would be an opening for this. And so I'm uh, pleased to present uh, tonight uh, a reading, but he also asked me to accompany this with some pho pho photographs that he's taken and that uh, kind of reflect the spirit of this. And so this is um, a poem and some images by Octavi Octaviano uh, Merecias Cuevas, uh, who's a local community member and poet, and who I've had the pleasure of meeting a couple times and has been doing great activism work in addition to his art. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll just scroll the photos once, once we get started. Plant a seed of a second and cherish it. Nourish it. Watch, it grows to become a minute. Slowly blooming into an hour, beginning to run and fly wild like a youthful day. Harvesting curiosity into innocence today. Nyetie kua yo o ini o yo anyo u yo. At the end of the sunset, a fertile young day will marry the gorgeous night to salute the moon. Under seven stars, they'll unite to become a week, a middle-aged light shining with strength. The month of your hopes will dream deeper than the meditation of fall, brighter than the beauty of spring, mightier than the fertile sounds of summer, and stronger than the spirits of winter, unfolding you into the pages like a yearbook. This slow song of one decade this witness of wisdom, this discipline of experience, this old growth tree of life before your eyes, will engrave each memory in the stone of a century. Lu'u sha'a yitu yu oyin ini yu Plant another seed of a second and relish it, nourish it. The century of your legacy survives within the seeds of your seconds now. Thanks. Thanks, James. 
and I thought that was a timely opening to the time that we are all spending together um, in this work. And I also uh, will say that some of those words um, were in the Mistec language, so not a language I know or speak. I did my best. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all, and look forward to more inspirational moments uh, for future, uh, future meetings. Okay, well, thank you, James. And um, I'd like to start with doing introductions as we do at the beginning of each meeting. We'll start with committee members. If you could just state your name, your preferred gender pronouns, and your affiliation, and then we'll move to audience and staff. Michael? Uh, Michael Eden Hill, he, him. Robin Wang, he, him. Faith Graham, she, her. Jeffrey Moreland, he, him. Maria Sippen, she, they. Andrea Hamburg, she, her. Megan Horst, she, her. Sam. Sam Barroso, he, him. Katie Lister, she, her. And is June? Did we lose June? Hi, and this, this is Jan Valdez, uh, he, him. Janet Hammer, she, her. Mara Mijares, he, him. Steely Cortez, he, him. Pete Lee, he, him. Brendan Haggerty, he, him. Jenny Hall, she, her. Jeff Strang, Portland NAACP. I don't have a pronoun preference. And our sound technicians from OpenSignal. <laughs> Hi, my name is Thaddeus. I'm a he, him. Tony, he, him. All right, thanks. So just real quick, wanted to walk through the, um, just go through the agenda. Everybody has a copy and was emailed them, um, but we're gonna first, after we walk through the agenda, approve the meeting minutes from the last meeting and then move into public comment. Um, then we'll have a presentation from Brendan, who's sitting in the audience right now, on um, social vulnerability to climate change, followed by a presentation from members of the coalition, as was requested at the last meeting. Um, and then a, present, a short presentation, kind of a refresher on some of the decision-making methodologies and options that you have. James will be giving that presentation, and then our hope is that you will be able to determine a decision-making um, model that you can use at least until you have bylaws that have been drafted and adopted. Sam will give an update on the timeline and agenda content, and then we'll move into a work session at 7.55. During this time, we'll mute the phone since folks will not um, be using microphones or sitting at the table the entire time. The work session goals are really to identify subcommittees that are needed in the near term as well as future full committee agenda topics through May 2020, recognizing that things can change, but we do want to get um, kind of, we do want to identify what the committee feels is necessary now in terms of subcommittee work and what the, um, everyone kind of can agree should be on the agenda between now and May when we're in this, not only in this kind of like full committee orientation process slash getting ready to put an RFP out on the street for, um, to solicit grant proposals. Following that, we'll have about 15 minutes where we'll come back to a full committee session. We'll reopen the, f um, the phone lines, or the phone lines won't be open, we'll, but we'll unmute the phone line. And then if there, have, if there are kind of agreements or any proposals that committee, make, committee members want to make based on the work session, then they can do that during that time. So we would need to be back in the full meeting um, in order to form a subcommittee, assign members to serve on those subcommittees, um, things like that. And we would need a decision-making model to be able to do that as well. The default, if, uh, the default, if a decision isn't made about how to decide, can always be just a simple majority as well. So with that, I'd just like to ask if everybody has had a chance to look at the meeting minutes that were provided and just if there are any questions or edits or changes that you would like to see on them. All right, hearing nothing, we will, um, we will approve the minutes. 
and move, um, before we move into public comment, I just wanted to reintroduce Janet Hammer. Janet, can you come up? Janet is the newest member of the PSAF team. Um, you may have met her briefly um, at, the, at the council meeting that was at PCC, but um, I wanted to give Janet an opportunity to just take a couple minutes to tell you who she is and kind of her first major, the first major focus of her work as part of the PSAF team. Super delighted to be here and joining you in supporting this really important work. And um, thanks for your patience as I transition here um, to this amazing team. Um, one of the first things that I'll be devoting some big chunk of my time to is uh, you might recall that there is a workforce and contractor equity agreement that's referred to in the legislation, the ordinance that was passed. So we'll be um, looking at some of the models to build on. There's been some great work done in the region. Many of you are probably familiar with the um, Metro's con C2P2, the Construction Career Pathway Project Framework. The city is a signatory to that. Um, so we'll be looking at that and other models, kind of doing some of the heavy lifting to come up with a draft point of departure, aiming for a January kind of work session to bring different stakeholders together to say, you know, here's some of the issues we're grappling with, what would work, what, what might we be missing, um, kind of moving that process along. And then also uh, supporting the team with, um, and I can share the details about anything you want to know about that piece, but in case you were like, oh, it says that we're supposed to come up with this whole framework and how we're going to fit that in. We have a team here to support you with that. Um, and then also uh, another piece of kind of some heavy lifting is around the, um, how are we thinking about the solicitation and rating and ranking and deciding and then evaluating and knitting that all together and be um, providing some support in that arena and others as well. Anything else you need from me right now? Not right okay. now, unless right. there are any specific questions right now for Janet from the committee. All right. You know where to find me, I believe. <laughs> I did also just realize that I didn't ask if there was anyone on the phone. Is there anyone on the phone? Okay. If the person on the phone can introduce, would like to introduce themselves. One second, we're gonna have you introduce yourself one more time as we bring you up to the mic. We're trying to find the exact location so we don't get echo on the phone. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself one more time? No. We may need to do a little bit of work to bring him back online. Okay. We'll check back in with <laughs> you on the phone later. So it looks like we have one person who signed up for public comment, Pete Lee with the Democratic Party of Oregon. Do you want to come up here? like to be as tight as possible. Perfect. I know there's a lot on this agenda, um, so I'll keep it very brief. Um, uh, in March, I was honored to be elected as the vice chair and DNC member of the Democratic Party of Oregon. I've been involved with renewable energy for over 11 years now, and I cannot emphasize enough um, that I really feel that history is being made here with the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, I've been involved um, with a fair number of DNC meetings, including a very uh, vibrant discussion about a uh, climate crisis debate in San Francisco in August that I suspect you've probably heard of. And one thing I've learned is, is that um, PSEF is a great example of things that um, way too many people nationally, including Democrats, don't think it's possible to have a bold response to climate crisis and to do so with an incredible coalition that brought forward an incredibly challenging uh, ballot measure and won. And I really believe that um, I'm watching history being made here um, to advance social justice, climate justice, economic justice, 
and cultural justice, especially for disadvantaged communities. So thank you for all of your work. And I look forward to participating more and helping where I can. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, for the people on the phone, or for the one person on the phone, um, we're on slide six now, and I'd like to ask Brendan to come up. He's our first presenter, and he is um, going to present on the social vulnerability to climate change, and I'm going to let him drive here, so we're going to do a little seat switching. Thanks. Um, so my name is Brendan Haggerty. I'm a senior research evaluation analyst at Multnomah County Health Department, um, and Sam asked me to come tonight to talk about how climate change impacts health uh, and who's most vulnerable to those impacts. Um, in my current role, a big part of it is to monitor the health impacts of climate change in Multnomah County. Um, and prior to this, I served as epidemiologist for the, the state's climate and health program. So I'm going to try to walk through addressing these three questions tonight. We'll talk about how in some basic terms, how health is impacted by climate change more generally. And we'll get specific about who's most impacted um, and then finish up by exploring some of the tools we have to understand how those populations are distributed in Multnomah County. Um, and we, I obviously, I talk about the county a lot uh, as my default, but I know this is um, city specific. And before we get into it, I'm going to just define a couple of terms, get just a tiny bit jargony, um, because I, I tend to use these terms a lot. Um, <clears throat> and so I use the term health outcome to refer to the end point in a chain of events that results in an illness or a death. So if you think about all the contributing factors and the complex web of events and circumstances that ends in, that results in, say, a, ca a case of cancer, a case of diabetes. Um, that endpoint is what I call a health outcome. And all of the things that led up to it, I refer to as health determinants. Sometimes a good way to think about that is the causes of the causes. So if you think of an example of that is in the case of cancer, um, you could say air pollution was a contributor. So the cancer is the health outcome, air pollution is a health determinant. And there are also causes of the air pollution, right? And um, all sort of all of those things are on the determinant side. Hopefully that's <laughs> succinct enough. Um, so how does climate change impact health? This is a graphic from the Centers for Disease Control, um, their Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. And the the reality is that climate change influences many, many health outcomes, um, more than we can describe fully today. Uh, and honestly, we're learning about new ones all the time. Um, so I'm going to try to highlight a few, um, some that are, I think, really important and some that are maybe counterintuitive. Um, <clears throat> So this is an example of where we see determin health determinants toward the center of this graphic and health outcomes at the, at the outside. And what it's trying to illustrate is that climate change radiates out into you know, these, these um, sort of secondary determinants and then finally influences outcomes. So the most obvious one of these is extreme heat, right? That's, we have the term global warming for a reason. Um, <clears throat> and we're projecting uh, big increases in extreme heat days and extreme heat events, so like a heat wave in, um, during the warmer months. Um, heat illness and heat deaths are uh, a leading cause of death from, from extreme weather. In fact, in the US, they, uh, they account for more deaths than all other extreme weather events combined. Um, other examples of, of heat-related heat health outcomes are, in our area, drowning. Because as hot days occur early in the season, our rivers are running high and they're running really cold. Um, we tend to be not very nice to each other on hot days when we're irritated, so it, it 
uh, does actually have a documented association with uh, vi violent injury. Um, so you can see how even the most basic, the ma most basic um, effect of climate change results in multiple health outcomes. Some other examples uh, are air pollution, um, where we have increases in wildfire smoke, increases in ozone, resulting in asthma, cardiovascular disease, other, other health outcomes that are related to air pollution. Um, we worry about changing vector habitat. Vectors are um, animals that carry diseases. Uh, in this case, we, we mostly talk about ticks and mosquitoes and how their habitat changes and how that can change the distribution of diseases that are mostly found in warmer climates um, but might be changing their, their distribution. Um, I think one of the most interesting ones for our region is uh, an increase in in pollen. As the, as the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases, it increases not only the amount of pollen, but also its potency, which has results for all of us who suffer from allergies, but especially for folks who have an underlying respiratory illness like asthma. Um, and then we also have issues from, uh, from water quality impacts. Those can, uh, so waterborne illness, like um, cryptosporidium, like Campylobacter, um, those can occur following a big flood because um, it can affect drinking water sources. Um, but we can also have water quality impacts from drought as any contaminants in the water become more concentrated. Um, and one of those that we've experienced already in, um, in Portland is harmful algal blooms. Um, so when, when there's low flow, warm water, lots of sunlight, and lots of nutrients. Uh, harmful algal blooms can form and um, they, they make toxins um, that are harmful for humans and, and can be lethal for pets. Um, and the, that, that would be the issue that, sh that shut down Salem's water, drinking water supply, um, I think it was last year. Um, and then the last thing that I wanna to touch on is um, in the bottom left here is the forced migration, civil conflict and mental health impacts. And this is like this huge and unwieldy piece of this puzzle that I think we're, we're, we, we will continually be learning more about. Um, but I think it's something that a, a lot of the folks I work with are keeping a close watch on as uh, there's potential for um, people to be moving to this area as other areas of the country and the world become less habitable. Yes, um, for folks on the phone, we're now switching to slide 10. Um, so of this big constellation of health outcomes that are related to climate change, we've obviously put a lot of thought into this and identified the ones that we think are the most concerning locally. Um, and those are outcomes related to heat, related to air pollution, and related to vector-borne disease. So heat-related illness, um, is kind of self-explanatory, we've already talked about that. A lot of these, these this set of priorities was at, um, developed in 2013, 2014, and for the most part, I, I think not much has changed, but I would expand this middle category of respiratory and allergic disease to include more health outcomes that are related to air pollution. So um, the air pollution that we worry about comes kind of from two sources. One is wildfire smoke, and we've all probably experienced that. Um, exposure to particulate matter, even in that short period of time, can increase um, all-cause mortality, or deaths from all causes, um, and in particular, heart attacks or cardiovascular events. Um, so that's in addition to the acute respiratory effects that you might have, like an asthma attack, for example. Um, the other source of air pollution that we, we worry about is ozone, and the tagline for ozone is good up high, bad nearby. So we do want that layer in the upper atmosphere, but when we have it near the ground level, it causes negative health effects. And ozone forms from exhaust fumes interacting with sunlight. So it's, it, we, we reach higher concentrations on warm, sunny days in the summertime. 
Um, and then vector-borne disease, um, the main things that we were worried about there are West Nile virus, which is carried by mosquitoes, and Lyme disease, which is carried by ticks. Moving on to slide 11. So we've talked about sort of the general health effects of climate change, and now I want to talk more about specifically vulnerability. And this is a sort of an, another version that's similar to the, the graphic that we saw from Center for Disease Control. Um, but this comes from the National Climate Assessment, and I think it does a better job of acknowledging the context um, because you see the same sort of climate drivers causing different exposures or changing the determinants of health and resulting in outcomes, but you also have the environmental context and the social and behavioral context. And that's an acknowledgement that all of those exposures that are happening um, from changes in sort of natural hazards that we're exposed to are, are layered on you know, human-made hazards. Um, so the, those are often referred to as a, a threat multiplier for, for health outcomes because they're piling on stressors for folks who are already experiencing a lot of other stressors and who have fewer resources to cope. Um, so this is, a, uh, I think, a, a, a better way of showing that um, the health outcomes that we associate with climate change are, are all also interacting with poverty, with racism, and with access to power. And moving on to slide 12, um, let's talk, we'll talk about the concept of vulnerability for a moment. So this is vulnerability as a way to identify folks who are the most impacted, whose health is the most impacted by climate change. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a major national level report that made an attempt at um, kind of diving into vulnerability in more detail. And they defined it using these three, these three aspects of vulnerability of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, and I won't read their definitions to you, but, um, but I do want to kind of walk through an example. Um, and so we'll use the Eagle Creek fire from a couple of years ago to think through this concept. Um, and the thing that was kind of unique about that event is that it coincided with the beginning of the school year. Um, and so if you think about the kids and the air pollution they were exposed to during that time, um, a lot of schools, especially the older schools in Portland, um, don't have any indoor air filtration. Right, so, so we've established exposure, both indoor and outdoor, for that population. Children breathe in and cycle through more air in proportion to their body size. So they're getting basically a higher dose of any pollution that's in the air. So, so you have sensitive, both exposure and sensitivity. Um, and then when you think about adaptive capacity, you know, what, what options do, does a kid have without the inter intervention of adults to minimize their own exposure? Not a lot. Um, so you have the, the combination of exposure to a hazard, sensitivity to that hazard, and, and minimal um, capacity to adapt to it. And, and we would say that that combination of factors constitutes a vulnerability um, that, re that results in health impacts. And in this, in this case, that would be probably some acute respiratory issues. Um, so now we've kind of talked about the, the general health impacts of climate change, how to th think about vulnerability to them. And so I'm going to spend the rest of the, my time with you talking about ways that we can understand how vulnerable populations are distributed in our community. Um, a couple of years ago, I worked with uh, folks at the Coalition for Communities of Color and um, talked to nationwide experts to put together a vulnerability index for Multnomah County at the census tract level that cuts the, the county into pretty tiny little pieces. Um, and we combined this 
list of indicators um, that are similar to, but a little bit different from those three aspects of vulnerability that we just discussed. So one way you can think about this is um, the health outcomes are sensitivities, right? So if you, if you have an existing condition and you layer on a stressor like a really hot day or air pollution, that's, um, that's a sensitivity for you. Exposure, we got that one right. <laughs> um, and then the demographics piece is kind of a mix of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. And I think some of the, the ways you can think of adaptive capacity is um, the groups that are listed here have varying levels of access to information and access to power. Um, the, the ones that are in the orange box that, that shows up, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this for folks on the phone, we're, we're now on slide 13. Um, those are all, I think you could argue, they're all ways of measuring socioeconomic status. Um, so in a way, they're sort of all measuring the same thing in different ways. Um, and what we did is put all of these into a blender basically, and came up with one score, like between one and 100, um, that, that represents all of these things at once, in a, kind of at the neighborhood level. Um, and so the effect of that orange box is that we count socioeconomic status six times. So it's, the rest of them are unweighted, but socioeconomic status kind of counts extra. Um, and that's, you know, in some ways arbitrary, but it's consistent with what other um, other researchers and other jurisdictions have used. Um, and it's also important because socioeconomic status is the strongest predictor of overall health and life expectancy. Um, so from here, I'm going to move into uh, the, the interactive map. Um, so you can get a sense of this. And oh. Sorry, it's showing up correctly on the computer. Got to help with your broken hand. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Shell. Okay. All right. Um, so this is available online, um, and you can explore it yourself in depth. Um, you can see it was last updated in the middle of 2017. So some of what we're going to see is starting to get stale and is ready for a refresh and an update. Um, and some of the data sources have been updated since then. So just kind of a disclaimer. Um, so what this shows is um, darker areas are higher, have higher vulnerability scores. Um, and so you'll see kind of East County, some parts of downtown, um, some parts of North Portland, and then this is uh, 82nd Avenue right here um, that kind of pop out. Um, and so this is the representation of those, all of those indicators combined into a single score. But we also break them out individually. Um, this can take a second to load. Um, and you can, you can work through this and explore a little bit, but as you can see, this, this is um, estimated asthma prevalence in 2011. So now we're, we're, getting, we're getting kind of remote from that date at this point. Um, so when I said it was ready for a refresh, that's part of what I was referring to. Um, but we have each of those maps individually, and the, the narrative that goes along with them up here explain how each of these factors is, is um, related to a vulnerability to, to 
health impacts from climate change. And I think some of those things are um, less intuitive and some of them are uh, ripe for debate, honestly, that, that, um, that are worth having in-depth conversations about, does this really constitute a vulnerability? Um, and I've certainly had times where I'm at example, uh, instances where I'm uncomfortable pinning that, ta that label on one of these, uh, one or more of these um, variables. Um, so because there are so many of them, you have to use this drop down on the, on the right side. Um, And so the, as, as an example, you can kind of see how youth are distributed um, as, a, as a proportion of the population. And this might be important if we're thinking through um, interventions in, in schools. Um, it might be important if we're thinking about a vulnerability to heat illness because um, kids are less able to regulate their body temperature. Um, and you can kind of go down the line with each, with each of these. Um, and so some of you might be familiar with Dr. Larissa Zapata, um, who did similar work. Um, and we kind of were, were walking through this together at the time. Um, and in some ways, I, I think of this set of maps as sort of a prototype for what, what she ultimately submitted to um, the Oregon Environmental Council and Coalition of Communities of Color um, that was intended to inform state level efforts to allocate potential money from a clean energy jobs bill. Um, so that was sort of the, the genesis of this and, and the conversation that it was originally intended to inform. I think we're ready for a refresh and uh, if that can be in the service of this group, that would, that would be great. Um, and it's something that we can work with city staff on as well. Um, so with that, I might switch back to, well, we can explore this if, if you like, but I just wanna mention that at the, the last slide of that presentation is a set of resources if you'd like to get into more depth about how climate change impacts health. Um, and there's some specific guidance about, um, there's some specific resources on vulnerable groups, who's most impacted, and what public, local public health jurisdictions can, can be doing. Um, so with that, maybe I'll open for discussion or questions. Yeah, are there any questions or comments about the presentation or the material? Oh. Uh, yeah. we, we have, yeah, well, would you mind coming forward? Do we have the roving mic still? Yeah, unless, are there any questions from the committee? No. Oh, we can take one question from the audience, since there are none from the committee. Um, is, uh, the magnetic shift of the poles being considered when we're talking about climate change? Oh. Well, I'll say that um, I, I work in public health and so I have the luxury of not actually conducting climate science and I can rely on the work of others. Um, so uh, I'm not the right person to answer that question. Thank you. Brand please. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, just had a question um, around some of the, all the different factors. Um, for heat illness, is there, was there any information around uh, most impacted parties um, based on occupation? Or had there been any consideration in addition to that with climate vulnerabilities? I'm sort of thinking of like, Professions that like have to be outdoors, some of like letter carriers, construction workers, farm workers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, 
in some of the resources that I included, it's, um, it's, it's a hard thing to cover in a short period of time, but in some of the resources that I linked to, um, it walks through each, each determinant, climate determinant, and lists vulnerable populations. And so for heat, certainly folks who work outside um, are, are most vulnerable, especially if they can't avoid working outside. That also goes for air pollution and for vector-borne disease, um, as, as well as potentially allergenic disease. Um, and so, you know, that includes agricultural workers, um, people working in construction, um, as you mentioned, letter carriers, some of our own county and city workers. Um, I know we, we often have conversations with, say, parks um, about their staff, for example. Any other, sorry, Megan. Hi, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about this map. Um, you know, it seems really important and it seems like one tool, I suppose, in identifying frontline communities. I'm curious about the ability to like disaggregate and re-aggregate. Is it only possible to look at all 20 combined or one at a time? I'm curious about the like risk from air toxics one overlaid, for example, with people in poverty or something like that. And I also was curious what the risk from air toxics, is that kind of point source emitters or something like that? Um, so great question. Um, as this tool is set up, we can all, it only lets you look at all, all combined or each individually but it's certainly possible to reconfigure it so that we can do, you know, overlay whichever you want or do side by side. Um, and, and I think if we think about how, how to update it, kind of topic areas like air pollution might make sense. Um, your second question about what risk from air toxics is, is a, it's a, these are results from a national modeling study that estimated the cancer risk from air toxics, which is a set of air pollutants. Um, and it's kind of hard to see at this zoom, but um, so that's the, the cumulative cancer risk of all of those air toxics combined. Maria. Thank you for the spatial analysis and representation. It's um, something that's interesting to me and it's timely because today I was on a statewide call uh, on the transportation side of things to do an inventory of our system, but just talking about our need to create health layers with what we're doing. And I'm making assumptions about freight corridors and arterials and highways, but it, do you have a counterpart at OHA or is there any type of version that will layer transportation in this because I'm deeply concerned about freight corridors and how we are moving goods and focusing on moving goods but not really thinking thoroughly about its impacts on people. Mm -hmm. So is there a version of this that will make that layer or should I start to connect some dots at the state level and with you at the county so that we can lay the groundwork to do this um, statewide as well? Yeah, um, so the Oregon Health Authority has an environment, they call it the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program. Um, and they have kind of a similar tool that's much broader in scope, um, covers a lot of environmental health topics, and it's also in development right now. So not all of the data that they have is publicly published. Um, but but talking with them about it would, would get you access to to that data, there, it's something that they're usually happy to share. So um, I'm happy to connect you with folks there. Randfis, did you have a comment? No, we're good now. Okay, well, Brendan, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, it seems like there will probably be some follow-up and um, hope to dig into this a little bit more. Our next presentation is um, from the coalition. Oh, there's. Alan, I'd like to invite you and whomever else, including the dog, to come up. Right. Let me just 
Get you queued up here. Oh, I can scooch over in just a minute. Mm -hmm. So if you guys can try and remember to indicate what slide you're on for the person sure. on the phone, that would be great. So, thank you. Wow, this is really, so we're like a certain subset of your overall slideshow. Is that what's going on here? Yeah. Okay. How many slides do we have? I don't even remember. Several. 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Plenty. <Yeah. laughs> um, Maybe we should introduce ourselves first. Yeah, go for yeah. it. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having us today. Um, my name is Anissa Pemberton. I work at 350PDX as the Justice and Equity Organizer, and I serve on the implementation team of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Hi, everyone. My name is Alan Hippolito. I work for a nonprofit organization named Verde in uh, Northeast Portland's Cully neighborhood. And, uh, I'm also on the implementation team. Um, so we had a chance to talk uh, mm -hmm. ahead of time. And uh, while we will go through uh, some of these slides, we also have just kind of three big uh, areas uh, of information that we thought might. Did you have a question? No. I think okay. she's just moving here. Leftover question. <laughs> um, um, was, again, the history of, of the work that we did mm -hmm. to put the initiative together and pass it. Um, maybe some key provisions within the initiative itself that uh, we actually did a lot of thinking about during the drafting period to the extent that offers value to your work. Um, and then some of the sort of key things that we see coming uh, in the future, or ideas that we wrestled with throughout and are still kind of thinking are, are germane or important to consider as you move forward and, and making all the decisions you need to make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, just click on this and it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh dear. Okay. We're trying to pull up a video for you all, just to fill you in. <laughs> well, we'll pause. So I think, can I drive here for a yeah, second? Yeah, feel free. going to work? Okay. But most important, I think there'll be an empowerment of local groups. This is the first time that Portland has ever seen a coalition like this, uniting uh, communities of color, environmental organizations, uh, small businesses, labor, into really what makes up a new progressive majority in town. The Portland Clean Energy Fund is an initiative created by communities of color to have an impact on climate, uh, economic, and racial justice. It increases the business income fee by 1% for large retail operations that have $1 billion of national sales and a half million dollar sales in the city of Portland. The fund would generate between 50 and $70 million, and it would go to projects such as job training and workforce development, renewable energy, and energy efficiency projects and other efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know that if we want to preserve a livable planet, we need to get completely off of coal and dirty energy in the next couple of decades. And so the Portland Clean Energy Fund is designed in such a way to address both climate change and income inequality at the same time. Portland is a city of two tails, right? On one hand, Portland perceives itself as being very progressive and innovative and welcoming of everyone, yet we know that communities of color continue to be at the bottom of all those social determinants of health. Oregon itself has a long history of white supremacy, and you can see it even in our environmental movement. White, middle, and upper class homeowners tend to both dominate the movement, but also benefit the most from our renewable energy programs. For example, it's only usually only homeowners who get 
to benefit from the credits that go to solar installations. This initiative shows that communities of color also are passionate about, committed to, and have a vision for a just energy transition. So in Portland, we're seeing the effects of climate change most dramatically for air quality in the summer because wildfires all over the West. The heat waves have also had major impacts. I see it in my work because I get people from the community asking me for resources to help them stay cool in the summer. By reducing energy bills or even eliminating some people's energy bills, we can help keep people in their homes. You know, if you had seen us in January of 2016, we were just seven or eight people meeting in the basement of a church. We met every two weeks just putting the coalition together, building the relationships, answering questions, uh, revising, refining the initiative itself. After a year, we actually were able to start to have a more finalized concept that we could share with neighborhood associations, affordable housing providers, small businesses, and labor to build this really powerful coalition that was really the secret to our success. We worked on coalition building for about two and a half years before we launched the campaign. It took a long time for us to to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, to explain what our common interests are and our vision, and to build trust. Well, I've had a long history of working with white environmental groups in Oregon. They mean well many times, but they tend to take over tables because they believe that their expertise matters more than the expertise of other frontline communities, right? Communities of color who have actually been on the front line of many of these issues. And so we let them know that we were in the process of developing uh, this initiative, but we we're also very clear that we would want their support, but we didn't want them at the decision-making table. At the end of the day, they were all absolutely supportive. You know, it's important to like mind your own carbon footprint, but it's much more important to be involved in struggles to like change the system. That can be a lever for increasing justice. It could also be used in ways that reinforce pre-existing inequalities in our society. We try to be very mindful that the leadership of this coalition was people of color, and so our role was to support that. I believe that the Green, Brown, Black Coalition, uh, what benefits that coalition will benefit all Portlanders. Hey, Walmart, get up it. This guy is for the profit. Hey, Walmart, get up it. This guy is for the profit. Our opposition included some of the largest corporations in the world, including Walmart, U.S. Bank, Target, and Comcast. The moment that we filed it in court, they filed a court challenge. These are the same corporations that just got a 40% tax cut from the Trump administration. That generates billions and billions of dollars, 1% for a business that makes over $1 billion a year. We think is really important in the face of climate change and growing economic inequality. We think that 1% is corporations paying their fair share. So all these international, multinational wealthy corporations created a local PAC. They highlighted two immigrant-owned small businesses that once we talked to them, were appalled to find out that their names and pictures were being used on the website and asked their photos to be immediately retracted and signed on in support of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. I think it just highlighted the ways in which this corporate PAC was using manipulation and kind of deceptive tactics to, to pretend like they had local support. When, when actually the vast majority uh, supported, supported the Portland Clean Energy Fund. The false choice that big businesses try to present is that we have to choose between addressing the needs of our communities, such as good schools, you know, affordable housing, and climate change. The truth is, is that we can work on both of those issues at the same time. Right now, we have big business trying to weaken the initiative, and we want to make sure that this, that everyone knows that this nine-member grant committee will be appointed by our elected city council members. At every step of the way, the community will have a voice in determining how these funds are used. Now! Yeah. What do we want? Clean energy! What do we want? It? Yeah! Make some noise! Our campaign was run by people like me who had never really worked on a campaign before, but were passionate about the issue. We had to collect over 30,000 signatures just to get it on the November ballot. We provided a training for residents in English and Spanish and taught them how to go out and collect signatures. The day of, it also meant like phone banking. A 1% fee on billion dollar corporations. To be invested in local energy and solar. Oh,
I'm going to be positive. I'm calling about present and clean energy. So like, listen, oh, I know all about the present and clean energy friend, and they started explaining to me. I was like, well, you should come down here. Oh, thanks. I think what was so beautiful for me to watch hundreds, if not thousands of volunteers actually tap into that love and that commitment to a better world to fight for this. I was hearing different things, and so it was difficult to know one way or the other if it was going to pass. Measure 26201, it passed. It's a fun pass, and we all jumped up and cheered. I was just super happy because I knew that then we'd be able to make all of these projects happen. That kind of collective victory and that collective euphoria is, it was just so powerful in the room. In a time when people are feeling really a lot of despair, I think it gave us a sense that we can make a difference. We developed a solar curriculum to teach young people how to build solar cells and just expose them to the type of skills needed to enter the energy workforce. The fund will actually create the pathway for these students to access jobs. People hope to see that the Portland Clean Energy Fund will see hundreds of community projects that will help both lower people's energy bills as well as create living wage jobs that can allow people to stay in Portland and support their families. Well, what this win, I hope, means around the country is that communities of color collectively can decide their future. Despite the challenges at the federal level, we can achieve so much more at the local level. When you can come up with a proposal that actually handles three of the big ones, right, which is climate, economic, and racial justice all in one fell swoop, why would you not do that? I think we should aim big and be bold. I was fast on the escape button, I thought, though. That, that, was, that was pretty good. The Sierra Club endorses Chris Van no. Hollen. <laughs> I, I, did, I did think it was your phone. I'm sorry, because this looked like it was off. I was like, what's that? OK. All right. All right, then. I, I, yeah, I, I see get, how it is. OK. All right. It's, uh, so I'm going to actually, I think you all know a lot of, so we're going to kind of skip over things that I think you know. And let me say that we really want you all to just jump in and ask questions and have a dialogue. It's less about us just downloading things and then trying to accordion some Q&A at the end. So maybe we just do that first. Like anything from that that raised a question for anyone that we can try to answer? No. Okay. Oh, right. Randy. So I was struck by a comment that Khan made in the in the video. Um, sort of, a, I'm going to paraphrase the quote: "Is like every step of the way, a community will determine how those funds will be used." So I know the limitations in a ballot initiative to be able to sort of define how those funds will be determined by a community. But was there like some kind of like big vision initially, like sort of thinking creatively how community will determine how those funds are being used? So I think, um, jump in here, please. I think what, as I heard that, I think that uh, Khan was forecasting y'all and your role, that this grant committee was designed to be by and of community, um, both racially, economically, geographically, lived experience, um, and that y'all were going to set the vision for how the program was going to be implemented and how you were then going to work with other stakeholders out in community to design and implement uh, the program. I will say that 
in the initiative itself. Um, the section on the grant committee was probably one of the sections we worked on the hardest uh, to try to try to craft that vision. Yeah, I would just agree with Alan on that one. <laughs> was that responsive to your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, you know that, you know that, you know that, you know that, you know that. <laughs> You know that. You know that. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think that is, is important, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Can you say the slide number? Uh, slide 26. I'm sorry. I've, I've scrolled over about seven slides. We're on the slide 26. Did you want to talk about the history a little bit? Is that what you were thinking? We're talking about election night. We can talk about field campaign. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about history. And then again, the other two areas are just specific provisions that we, we thought were important to highlight. And then some ideas we have for the, our thoughts for the future. Awesome. Um, I would note, so you saw all about the formation and the trust building and all of that. Um, I, I did want to call attention to uh, building the initiative itself, right? So substantial rewrites over uh, a one-year period of time, probably maybe a dozen different iterations of the initiative. Um, and in the end, or originally it was much more prescriptive and had a lot more numeric goals. Uh, so for example, um, project types, much more descriptions under the funding categories, renewable energy, energy efficiency, green infrastructure, et cetera, of what kind of projects we were looking for there, and we, we dialed that back. Uh, also, uh, workforce and contracting goals, very specific numericals. Uh, we dialed that back as well, both because there needed to be a legal analysis to justify uh, setting specific workforce and contracting goals, but even more importantly, we didn't want to be prescriptive on what this committee would be able to do. We didn't want to tie your hands and say, well, it's only these kinds of projects or this has to be your goal. And we really wanted to empower uh, the committee to be able to form its own goals and develop the kind of information that was needed to set goals. Um, and the, the other thing I would highlight about that development, yes? I didn't mean to cut you off mid-sentence. You can continue on the sentence. Sorry, okay. Ellen. No, it's all good. Um, uh, this feels like a, yeah, it's all good. Um, and then I would just highlight the part where Khan referenced where we immediately had to defend the initiative in court. Uh, and there's a couple things I would share about that. Is one is that was really the first time where the coalition partnered formally with the city because it was the city's legal counsel and our counsel. They were co-counsel in the defendant role against the two plaintiffs uh, that were arguing uh, both trying to change the ballot title and the summary, but also just trying to get the, the whole thing thrown out. Uh, and so that was the kind of the real beginning of the partnership that we've built uh, to this day. And then I would also highlight that that was really the first formal appearance of what is still uh, those interests that would seek to weaken uh, or eliminate uh, the initiative. And very quickly uh, after that, uh, working through intermediaries tried to convince us to drop the whole thing. Um, so that was the very first time that they set up, said, we don't like what you're doing, we want to stop you. And they continued to do so uh, throughout and still today. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Please. So my question was, how did the coalition come up with those numerical um, objectives or goals? So the goals that do exist, uh, the 20% of all uh, funding, the 50% of the renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, one was part of a general framework of really trying to make it facilitate the competitiveness of frontline community serving organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we actually went back and forth a lot on that 20%. There was a some real question about whether that capacity even existed uh, in frontline community serving organizations out of the box. Um, 
Some of us pushed for higher, some pushed for lower. 20 is where we settled, and in part because we knew that at least early on, um, there was a tremendous affordable housing need for weatherization and renewable energy. And so we felt there was strong capacity in the affordable housing community to help reach that initial 20%. Um, and then over time, with the kind of capacity building and new communities and that would be coming, that that goal would actually be able to be exceeded uh, over time. And how about the prescriptive numbers that actually didn't make their way into the initiative, the final? Um, I think those were just kind of based on some existing best practices, 20% minority women mm -hmm. owned emerging small business goals, you know, 15 to 20% workforce goals. So we looked at things that Clean Energy Works did, other things that were happening out in the industry, but again, they were maybe based on uh, either a different sector or a different time and uh, in the work that we were doing with minority business advocates and their legal counsel, they were like, you can't throw those numbers in there now. You have to give that to the grant committee so that they can get the legal underpinnings to justify, if they want to, more specific allocations. We also went round and round about uh, emerging small businesses. Um, that's something you all have to tackle. Verde, we don't count those in our uh, progressive, when we set contracting goals for our projects. We, we count them, but we don't set goals for ESBs. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and so that's where, uh, that's signature gathering and such. Yeah, so um, I joined 350 PDX in July of 2018. So I came in right when the signature gathering was finished. Um, I was actually there in the last couple of days <laughs> to see it, and it totally caught me off guard <laughs> that I was entering this movement um, that had all this capacity. Um, and I think one of the things that was clear from the start is that we were not running a traditional uh, ballot measure campaign. Um, in a lot of ballot measure campaigns, you have large organizations that are funding you know, a certain pot of money. Um, in our case, we had a lot of organizations who were basically donating time um, and taking a little bit of a hit especially privileged organizations and some frontline communities as well. Um, we also, so because of that, we had to really rely on our volunteer base. Um, 350 PDX, I believe, brought out about 250 people um, throughout the campaign, which is quite a lot of people for uh, one person <laughs> to try to organize. Um, and I think other organizations brought out about 500 people in total. And so we were just constantly building up our volunteer leadership, really elevating people into different positions and trying to push a volunteer-led campaign on the ground. Um, and this meant that because we were such a broad coalition, we were able to really listen to frontline communities and understand what they needed. Um, to get their folks out to vote. And so we did things like reaching out to communities that are usually ignored in traditional campaigns, frankly. Um, east of 82nd and North Portland in particular sticks out to me as, or, as places that people were not used to having people knock on their doors. It also presented other challenges. You know, if you're not used to getting knocked on your door, <laughs> you may not know how to respond to someone knocking on your door. And some folks would feel a little nervous. Um, so we also listened to frontline communities about these different cultural experiences that people had with people coming to the door and knocking and how to knock the right way, how to stand at the door the right way, very <laughs> intricate sort of learning processes. Um, but because we did all this work reaching out, we were able to register a lot of new voters. Um, we were able to get a lot of new people out to vote, people who didn't speak English as their first language in particular, um, people who spoke Chinese or Vietnamese or a language that's not normally addressed in our community as a need. Um, so we, that was all very important to the field organizing. We did end up having the ability to hire a false small field staff and that proved very helpful in the long run because people like me <laughs> have other duties <laughs> um, to attend to. So that was very helpful in the end. Um, from a communications standpoint, our strategy was really to unite um, the green, brown, black coalition, as we say. Um, we really wanted to focus on economic justice, racial justice, and climate justice, and intertwine those in our narrative. And I think um, the comms team did a brilliant job doing that, as well as responding often to things that were just happening in time, real time. You know, things like the story of um, the opposition targeting small businesses owned by immigrants. You know, those folks didn't speak English. 
So they didn't know <laughs> what they were agreeing to, frankly. Um, and nobody took the time to explain it to them. So really reaching out into our communities and knowing that frontline communities had those connections and really spending time to understand what was happening. Um, and we also held a lot of different demonstrations outside of Walmart, at Portland Business Alliance, and different communities that were oppositional, different corporations that were oppositional. Um, in the end, we were able to get 200 plus organizations to sign on in support, which was amazing. We had labor partners show up, we had racial justice groups show up, we had groups that are just tiny little neighborhood, you know, community groups that not a lot of people know about. Um, and we did a lot of outreach to make that happen. Um, we had the largest amount of testimonies in the voter guide um, in Portland's history. I believe our voter guide was about 10 pages long, um, and the opposition's was about half a page. Um, <laughs> We just continually, I think overall, the thing that we learned was just to continually adjust and be responsive to the landscape and how it's changing and also to really trust our frontline community partners in knowing what they need to be successful and knowing how privileged organizations like 350 PDX can show up and be supportive in the work that we're doing together. So a few, just a few key provisions that we thought we'd share. Um, that we spent a lot of time working on or were really raised up by the frontline community organizations during the drafting of the initiative. Um, the protecting renters provision, we're all familiar with that 81A4. Um, that's gonna be hard work, but we, we knew that investments in properties are uh, and in fact, there was an editorial, I think, about that just like two months ago that was otherwise praising uh, the initiative, but arguing that landlords should be able to recoup the value of the investment in their property when it wasn't their money in the first place, which we thought was strange. So that's, you know, that's just a motif that exists, and so we wanted to call it out specifically. That's going to be you know, diligent work uh, ahead to figure out how do you actually enforce that, what kind of organizing is going to be need to happen from nonprofits to actually get into a relationship with landlords if they're not already market shielded housing. Um, very clearly the relationship to the city's 100% renewables uh, resolution, which actually passed kind of in while we were in the drafting. Um, in particular, uh, there's a provision in the 100% renewables called community based renewable energy infrastructure. Um, where the city and the county have both committed that by 2030, 2% of all the energy in the city will come from community-based renewable energy infrastructure. And the city went further and said by 2050, 10%. And so those of you, you know, who work in energy know that a 10% shift in energy generation in the city is massive. Um, and so there are other processes going on, uh, zero cities and such, to help define what community-based renewable energy infrastructure is. But we viewed the fund uh, as a way to start to drive those resources into communities so they could develop their own renewable energy infrastructure. Um, the workforce and contracting, we talked a little bit about that. Um, we wanted to make it easy for things that are working to be brought to you to consider. And that's why there's that language about considering best practices as appropriate. So that if someone's doing really good work at Bureau of Environmental Services or, or Prosper Portland or Peabody, and they've, they've gotten real good results, they can bring that to you and say, hey, this has worked really well in this field, that field. Could you consider it as part of your practice? Um, so that's what that was about. That's a uh, section seven, Point five point F. Um, section A2A on co-benefits, that was also came out of the frontline communities uh, responding to uh, an earlier practice of like really just focusing on the environmental benefit and we wanted to really emphasize that an environmental investment can do many things in community. That's uh, A2A. Do you want to talk about the last uh, two? Uh, the geographic diversity. Sorry. The nonprofit led as the leader. Oh, yeah. Here. Um, so, nonprofit led um, lead applicant, it's on section 3.9 and 8.2C. Um, it's important that nonprofits are leading the proposal, but there may be nonprofits that are applying for multiple um, grants or part of multiple grants or partnering on multiple grants and thinking about how to manage that and what that will look like. 
Um, and then geographic diversity, which we all know is really important as Portland changes, um, as Portland is more gentrified and communities of color in particular are being pushed out from, to east of 82nd. Um, Yeah, it's uh, it's right here also. Oh, mm. so yeah. yeah, there's this part of the uh, program. So uh, eight eight two B, it says geographic diversity. Um, let's see if that's right. So, so. I think that's what she. Said. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, you'll note there that it talks about sort of um, funding projects that operate at a neighborhood level. And that was some of the early thinking. And again, the frontline communities came in and said, well, that's really cool and everything. And we need to approach these problems that scale both climate action and economic justice. But our frontline community organizations aren't necessarily operating at that kind of scale, particularly not in this sector. And so that's why you see uh, that language about that the committee may also consider providing support to organizations to develop and expand their capacity to implement projects on a larger scale. Um, so that was the intention uh, behind that. Thanks, so. Or that was the conversation that we had. Any questions about that bit? I guess this is a question for um, you all, but also maybe staff. Is there, is there a narrow definition on nonprofit or is that as broad as the IRS defines nonprofit? I believe, and Sam can correct me if I'm wrong, that the definition we have so far is that it's um, a tax-exempt nonprofit that is registered with the state of Oregon, with the Secretary of State, yeah. And was that the original intention of uh, the PCEF coalition? Yeah, I think that's the, the definition, is that we, we didn't just go 501c3, that uh, trades, um, other sorts of iterations of 501 could, uh, 501c could uh, apply. Now, whether they all have equal access or you favor one subset over the other, it's, I think that's on the table, um, but we didn't refine it that, that tightly. Because we understood there were, sorry, because workforce job training programs aren't always necessarily run by C3, sometimes they're run by other kinds of nonprofits, um, and we didn't want to, for example, those kinds of resources to be denied them. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you were considering scale and ability for these nonprofits to have the capacity uh, to make some of these projects happen. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's, what, you, what you're, you know, kind of thinking of in those areas and, and you know, what maybe offers some advice for us as to, you know, we might be granting, you know, a significant hunk of funds to a nonprofit that just can't handle it. Right, and that will end up being bad for everybody in the long run. So what was your thinking along those lines? Um, well, I think I, I would say that a, a few things, feel free. Um, I, I think we, we had a lot of conversations about a range of sizes and different sorts of um, sort of offerings of proof that an applicant would need to make depending on how big of a project they were taking on. And that, you know, the, the bigger the project, the more complex the project, um, the more, the greater an offering of proof that that applicant would need to provide in terms of their financial systems. Um, maybe the application is more detailed for them. And so, so an ability to fund a, a 5,000, a $10,000 small project in a community for a new organization all the way to, you know, a million to $5 million project. Those are probably not the same applications. You're probably not asking for the same offerings from those and in between. So there's radiation that you could do and that we talked about uh, a little bit, but setting those sort of tiers or something like that is, I think, squarely within the kind of things that y'all will be thinking about. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how um, community organizations have been, have they been partnering together uh, to kind of bring together um, different qualities and uh, different expertise within the community organizations? Because I know that some actually have expertise in building and construction projects, some in 
you know, community development? Um, are they are they coming together at this point um, to create Toward this opportunity? Yeah. Um, we have the event on Thursday, um, and I know that organizations are talking about. I know that I can speak small, but in Cully, organizations are talking about it. What can we do for the mobile homes? What can we do for new affordable housing uh, that's coming? What can we do for Douglas heat pump projects that are uh, in the neighborhood? I know that other organizations are talking about it, um, how far they've gone in forming formal partnerships. Um, I can't say. Um, I, I would say that um, one of the things that we were responding to and that you're making, you're calling to mind is um, that the toolkit that existed before, uh, I think as um, Catalina was saying in the video, was too small. There were not sufficient resources close to addressing the problem of either the climate issue or the economic inequality, and that those sources were difficult to access. They required us. Um, you know, one program that uh, we were able to work with, the application was 14 pages. It had 90 pages of attachments um, and was all reimbursement based. And so if you're a small, and this was for a neighborhood church, right? If you're a church in a neighborhood, you can't carry subcontractors for a year mm -hmm. while you wait to be repaid, much less you're not a grant writer and you're putting together a hundred and something pages of application that includes equipment specs and warranties and plans and designs. So the toolkit was too small um, and it was too hard to get to. And I think that what these groups are responding to is a, uh, a bigger resource that, that is meant to be accessible for them. Mm -hmm. Mm. So just following up on that, did you find examples of that? Of? of resources that were more accessible to community groups mm. and frontline communities? So I think there is a shift going on in, in philanthropy right now, mm -hmm. um, particularly in environmental philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my hope is that you'll have an opportunity to learn about that shift and engage with some of those institutions. And I'll give you an example of an institution that, that we have seen is starting to change. And it's a, a continuum. Um, Meyer. Memorial Trust, our second largest funder in the state behind uh, Oregon Community Foundation. Um, they've done a lot of work, uh, internal and external, to build their focus on equity and justice. And then that mindset, as it's sort of started to change their practice of grant making, this is, I think is very illustrative because it's a change that they're still trying to make today. Um, so as recently as three years ago, they had three pots of money. They had an education pot, um, a building community pot and an environment pot. And they used to have a rule, and many funders are like this, where you could be the lead applicant for one pot and you could be a partner with someone else on mm -hmm. maybe one or two others. Mm -hmm. right? But if you think about frontline communities, many of frontline community serving organizations are not single issue organizations, right? An ERCO, a NEA, uh, an Urban League, um, what have you. They're running nutrition programs, after school programs, housing, job training, domestic violence, elder programs. And so they had to pick one. And so they're like, well, we're going to build community. And so I guess we can't apply for the housing, for the environmental pot, even though the environmental pot was full of equity guidance. And so what you saw in some funding rounds, and I'm not trying to, this was an iteration from, I'm not trying to badmouth Meyer because they're doing a great job on a trajectory, was you saw maybe one or two real frontline community serving organizations in that portfolio early on and like eight mainstream organizations hiring equity coordinators. And I think what I think we would share with y'all is that because of these historical disparities, right, because these are multi-issue organizations, because they've been excluded from a toolkit that was too small and inaccessible, that you're going to have some groups that are ready to go your housers and some other folks. And then you can have other groups that you're gonna to wanna to build over time. And I think we would urge you to have a grant making perspective that allows you to make multiple grants to single organizations, particularly 
early on, or you're going to find that you're funding three to six real frontline community serving organizations, and everything else is going to be a mirror of what Meyer encountered in that first environment. Hi, thank you, and for all the thought that has gone into the language. I have a kind of narrow question and a bigger one. My narrow question is on the, um, the renter protections. I'm just curious if in any of your groundwork you found um, examples out there. That's question number one. <laughs> yeah, um, I've been doing a little bit of research into it after Commissioner Hardesty brought it up. I, I got curious. Um, and I've learned that there are weatherization programs um, that have somewhat successfully managed to control the rent increases. And the way they've been able to do this, from my understanding, and I'm happy to share this information with the committee, if that would be interested too, um, is that they would basically tie landlords into <laughs> um, not raising their prices. Um, and it, they would sign contract for 10 years. And then if, when the con if they, for example, sold their property, that contract would stay with the property. And so that would kind of limit new landlords from increasing rent on folks. Um, and I believe it was like a percentage amount that you were allowed to raise per year, but it wasn't, you know, the full like new value of your property when you have all this new insulation in, for example. Um, so I'm happy to share more of that information with folks um, and also connect you all to anybody I've been kind of whispering to and talking to um, out of curiosity, because that deeply concerns me as a renter. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I'm assuming one of our subcommittees will dig into that and staff will hopefully help us. And I have a couple of colleagues who I've been pinging their ear on who work on housing affordability. It sounds like a, model, a trust model. Nice. Anyway, uh, my other question is more broad. Uh, what is the coalition's like plan going forward? Will you stay engaged and how are you, can, like how are you supported? Are you, are your, are the member organizations continuing to donate time into this? I'm just trying to understand and like the relationship and how you're continuing and yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a great question. Um, yeah, the Portland Clean Energy Fund is con coalition is continuing to exist. Um, we're going through a strategic planning process in February, so we're anticipating kind of getting more of an idea of what we're going to be working on in the future. Um, I think we're open to, like, we want to work with the grant committee as you all need us to work with you. So, you know, I, we would kind of bend our knee to you to invite us into spaces when you feel like it's appropriate. Um, and then I feel um, also that we're, I think all the organizations are continuing to fundraise for positions like myself to continue to put some time towards it. Um, and we're continuing to like really invest some considerable resources for our organization in the coalition. Um, long term, I think the coalition really understands that we've hit a really critical need in our community of speaking to the you know, the Green Black Brown Coalition. And so I think we really are looking forward to envisioning how we can continue to be um, evolutionary in our approach. Thank you for all the work that you all did on the ground to get us where we are today. I still get chills when I watch those videos because it still continues to resonate just how powerful it is to mobilize um, our community members, especially those who have been disempowered or who have had power taken from them. So thank you for that work. I would like to know, how do you determine membership for your coalition? How do people get in that club? Because yeah. this is definitely an esteemed group of people and organizations that I, I also look up to. Um, next, what are some concerns that the steering committee or the coalition has um, with this implementation phase that we're about to embark on? Yeah, yeah. So we're actually discussing um, what it looks like for us to expand as a coalition, particularly the implementation team. Our coalition itself is very broad and we've been very open to having new organizations join the coalition. However, who sits on the implementation team has in the steering committee um, is a little bit more narrow. But we have emerging groups that we are interested in bringing into that team. And so that's part of our strategic planning um, process is we're going to be deciding from moving on from here, how are we going to continue to grow the coalition? Um, concerns. Um, I would say a couple things for us. Um, again, we, we put a lot of attention in the initiative to making sure that we were really providing a competitive advantage 
for the communities that are meant to be benefited, that are on the front lines of climate change. Because we knew, oh, it's not like this was some genius realization that new pot of money, folks are going to come for it. Um, and so um, I would say, and that, so there's one concern and about that aspect of it, who actually gets resourced and who, um, where do the dollars make an impact, right? Um, and so one of the things that, one of the reasons we work so hard on this section around the grant committee um, is because we knew, uh, or we wanted a grant committee that through their lived experience, through their work experience, and through the technical assistance and relationships they had, would understand the difference and would develop a really high filter and capacity to understand a firm commitment to justice and equity versus a soft commitment. Would you call it fakeity, fake equity? Fake equity. Um, <laughs> you know, that your applicants are showing history of working together. They're showing an existing relationship. We believed then and do now that nonprofit groups are going to form just to access this money, and they'll they and so, and also looking with the, with the eye to like look within the grants of where is the money going? Who, what, what's proposed? Are, we, are they asking the community group to do outreach for 10% of the grant and 90% of it is going uh, over here? Which or, who or which uh, partners in the grant grow because of the project, right? Who comes out of the project stronger and with a stronger uh, footprint in the sector? And because you're going to get a lot of lip service to the terminology. And, you know, there's folks who served on like uh, contract review panels for the city uh, and the uh, evaluator program that I think the city has. You, folks have developed the expertise to be able to look at applications and see who's really going to deliver and who's just saying the right things and hoping that you can't tell the difference. And that's why y'all are so, one of the reasons why y'all are so important is that you can tell the difference and you'll only get stronger with that over time. So that's first concern is where does the resource really go? And the second is protecting the program against those who would weaken it or eliminate it, right? You have opposition. We have opposition. Um, they're real. Their job, they're paid. They go to work in the morning, trying to figure out how to weaken or eliminate PISA, right? That's what they're paid to do. Um, they'll work to influence you. They'll work to influence the city. They'll work to influence the state. Um, and they'll, you, they'll do the same lip service. They'll use the same terminology around climate action and economic inequality and the aims of the measure to say, well, if you really cared about climate change, we could do this or, well, you know, this is really what we do is really economically good. And so they'll use that. And so in terms of where our coalition sees ourselves, you know, um, we would really encourage you all to work with your team, uh, other parts of the city, uh, our coalition and other stakeholders to develop and implement a a real purposeful strategy to advance and protect the program against what will be continued opposition. If I could spend, you know, $10,000 a year on lobbying, 5,000 a year, and have a chance to eliminate much more than that in tax liability, that's a good business decision for me. So those are the two concerns. Resources go where they should, protect the program. Anything you would add to that, please? Yeah, I would just add that um, at the state level, which is not as much of under our control, there's already been um, some movement to kind of make sure that a clean energy fund in a local community wouldn't happen again. And it was slipped into a bill that we overall do support. Um, and so I, I just want to mention that because, you know, the opposition has a lot of different types of resources, um, as Alan was alluding to. You know, there, it's not just that they're going to be talking to you or to us, they're going to be talking to state legislators, they're, they're going to be, you know, all over the place. And so it's part of that experience of being kind of responsive and aware and kind of always 
self-aware about what's going on around us and how it's going to impact this really important community investment. We are just about running up against time, but I just wanted to, um, I know that this is an important conversation, so I just wanted to make sure that nobody else had any kind of questions or comments. Jeffrey and Andrea, we haven't heard from you guys, which is okay, but I just wanted to make sure that you didn't have anything to say. I appreciate you coming after many years of work on this, and I think all of my questions so far have been answered. Um, again, I appreciate what you guys, the work you guys have done up to this point. The only thing I would add is um, obviously you're going to have to bring in some bigger organizations that, you know, have, have traditionally not necessarily um, had, uh, have the track record of um, being involved with the community or whatnot. And one of the things that I would like to make sure that we do is that we, 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 get, we incentivize them to, to do those kind of things to make sure that they're actually get get into that that frontline community and that we're we're not allowing them to um, take take advantage of the process which has happened up to this point so that's the only thing I have, I have to add on that thank you Michael and then we will move on I guess mine's a less technical question but um, what does what's your dream look like your personal dream of how this ends um, like how the funds would be used? Like, um, how do you see the community looking? Oh, yeah, I'm a big visionary, <laughs> so I can take this one. Um, I, you know, I kind of imagine when I was living in Southwest Portland of just like having a solar panel on the apartment building um, that, and having like insulation that actually kept my house warm. Um, and, you know, even like the single pane win windows, having those replaced and, thinking about, you know, now I'm privileged enough to live in a house that has all of those amenities and it's a huge house and we pay less in utilities per month than we did in this tiny apartment I lived in. Um, and so I think those sort of changes, I think will have a huge impact on people's lives and on our community. And it can start really small in some areas, but it, it does matter, you know, every dollar investment to keep people in their homes and every time we invest in renters is going to really have a long-term impact. Go ahead. That was, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, um, to piggyback on that, that so, so many of our communities have been excluded from this world and the need and opportunity is so great. And I think one thing you can gain from our coalition and our campaign is that new community, frontline communities are the key to advancing this climate and justice agenda, right? The, the, our old models of making environmental change and policy are, they're done, they don't work, right? This is what works. And that's just for passing them, so for actually addressing the challenges, it's the same thing. There's, my dream has been in, in tandem with that is all these communities who haven't ever thought that renewable energy and energy efficiency resources or environmental funding was something that was meant for their community. Now it's there. And somewhere there's a, you know, there are groups of folks, three, four, five displaced Tong Tongans meeting in a church basement somewhere that, you know, are going to develop the greatest idea that we've ever heard of to uh, educate children and make homes more energy efficient. And that's what you're putting out there is the chance for that creativity and that human expression that hasn't had anywhere to go uh, in this, uh, in renewable energy, in, in climate, addressing climate change. You're gonna free that. And that's the innovation and change we're gonna need if we're gonna address uh, the issues uh, that are so challenging in front of us. And last thing, that's one reason and I want to share this with y'all, that we went round and round in the initiative development around the question of leverage, right? It's very standard grant making to say, hey, you bring leverage, that's good. And it is, right? You want to leverage dollars, right? You want to bring more. So, but early, in earlier iterations, it was a criteria, right? You have to bring leverage if you want to get this money. And the frontline community organizations pushed back and said, well, that's really cool and leverage is important but we don't want to disadvantage 
that small group with no balance sheet, right, without the big pockets, but the great idea and a real community need. So that's, that's the dream. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Your applause woke the small dog up. I'm going to ask James to come back up, and there's just one more sh brief, very brief presentation, and um, followed by some dialogue, and then we'll be able to actually stand up and stretch out a little bit before, and maybe take a bathroom break, although you can do that at any time, of course, um, before we go into the work session. But if you can just hang tight with us through this. Next piece, that would be great. Okay, and we're forwarding, for folks on the phone, we're forwarding through the slides to slide... 35. 35, and just breeze through a bunch. Um, so, yeah, hello, everyone, again. Um, and at the last committee meeting, um, you all brought up a question. I need to go back and look in the notes and remember who it was, but uh, about the process that you all will be using to make decisions and so some of you have seen this content before, um, and we thought it was a good opportunity to kind of go back and talk about that and allow for some more discussion. Because the first decision that the first five of you made was selecting the other four that have now all been seated in, in front of us here. Um, but there are a lot of different ways available to, as a group collectively, to arrive at decisions. Um, and so we wanted to put forward both some of those options as well as um, the recommendation that we've been working with and understand so far. Um, and so we'll, there's a, I'll, I'll say that there are actually quite a few more types of decision-making processes than we're presenting here. Um, for instance, theoretically, somebody could be appointed a executive for the entire committee and be a single decision-maker without any voting or anything like that. Um, in the spirit of PCEF, I'd say that probably doesn't align so well with the values. <laughs> so there does need to be some sort of um, group decision-making process. And so we're going to talk about two of the processes that are most often used in public organizations, um, in different types of, I guess, both faith groups, organizing work, political decision-making in our society. So those two um, are broadly uh, majority-based voting or, or, or kind of a ranked voting um, and consensus-based models. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both of these. Um, I'd say majority-based models have a long history in, in Western society and in our, in our culture and is really the dominant frame that a lot of uh, legislat legislative and regulatory decisions are made in where um, there is an opportunity for raising motions, seconding that motion, then having a yes or no vote um, among the decision makers and either a simple majority or some sort of set percentage majority um, becomes a prevailing decision that moves forward um, with the opportunity to make amendments and to change that if it does not pass. Um, the consensus-based model is one that works off of a few different uh, types of votes that aren't just yes or no. Um, and I guess in the graphic and how I would describe it is it's more of a vessel for decision-making um, than a balance of uh, a yes or a no. And so it's a process by which concerns can be raised and um, a outcome can be reached that the group feels comfortable with um, and is based on a, a broad consensus. So in a consensus-based model, um, there are effectively uh, four votes that can be cast or four types of votes um, with different implications as a voting member. And so those are, if a proposal is in front of a body, uh, to agree with that proposal. Um, to agree with the proposal, but with concerns, and have an opportunity for those concerns to be voiced, uh, to stand aside or to not vote, um, and then one that is 
uh, I guess not reflected exactly on this diagram would be what's called a blocking vote or a hard no vote um, in that somebody does not agree with the decision moving forward. And uh, depending on the type of um, consensus model, that can then kind of trigger a reevaluation of the entire decision or, um, or topic in front of in front of the committee. And so um, I think I've described the basics, and I'll just briefly kind of go through a few pros and cons uh, that come to my mind. There are more um, with with the with the two models. So um, majority based decision making is familiar. It's expedient. Um, it can, it does have opportunities for modification. Um, it does usually have an amendment process. Um, and it is what is most used in, in our world. Um, consensus ba based models um, offer a greater range of input and flexibility for voices to, um, to be heard and to not be marginalized by being in the minority on the decision. Um, but they can take more time, and so it can be more of an involved process to reach a consensus um, on, on a decision that's coming, coming in front of you. Um, and speaking of kind of that timeline or the, the process itself, um, I wanted to kind of go through the process that really we would um, the, or that's typically used in, in a consensus model. And so that's um, broadly that the first step is introducing and clarifying the issue that's being decided on and um, kind of defining the decision. And then exploring the issue um, and making a proposal uh, or looking for ideas and then making a proposal based on the ideas that, that are, are moving forward. And then uh, doing what's called a test for agreement. So um, I guess I've been maybe calling this a vote that's really in this model called a test of uh, really looking among the, the body to understand where people sit with that decision. And so that's where um, there can be those four different types of votes um, or, or voices of uh, agreement, uh, agreement with concerns, standing aside, or blocks. And then if there are concerns raised, um, there is a kind of mandatory element of this process which voices those concerns and then modifies the proposal to reach a consensus based on the concerns. Um, and then it's a, as you can say, kind of an iterative process that goes back for another test. And then if, um, if consensus is achieved, then the decision moves forward, or if effectively, if there's no blocks. Um, we had suggested as staff and the previous kind of uh, iteration of five of you, um, our understanding is an agreement that there could be up to one blocking vote or one dissenting vote. So it'd be a modif what's called a modified consensus approach where one individual could um, not accept the proposal or not reach full consensus, but if all other conditions of consensus were met, that that decision would move forward. And so I believe that that, you know, is still our, effectively our staff recommendation of what would be um, probably a useful process going forward. Um, and now, yeah, this is a discussion of how you would all like to make decisions. I would. Note that kind of in the in the diagram here, that full consensus is effectively the same as a full majority vote. I mean, the outcome winds, winds up being that the decision moves forward. Um, what is different, though, is committing to the process of raising concerns and talking about them again, rather than just moving on. And so um, that is something that, as you've heard kind of from the coalition members here, there's a lot of important decisions that you all will be making, um, and there is a bit of that trade-off between uh, the time required to come to consensus and the importance of those decisions. So um, I, I'm happy to answer questions uh, or just open it up into discussion between or amongst you all. Andrea? 
I don't have a clarifying question. I have a lot of opinions, and if there are clarifying questions, I'll wait. Robin? I just have my observations, not really a clarifying question, so. <laughs> then Andrea, go for it. Or, oh, there's a, there is a clarifying question. I do question. have a clarifying sure. question. Uh, where did this modified consensus model come from? Well, is it the high minutes principles or? Um, I mean, we, we've been as staff looking at a variety of different models and honestly Googling and pulling resources online that, um, that kind of reflect this. Um, I will say that the tradition of consensus based decision making is something that um, is rooted in many other cultures, um, including the Iroquois Confederacy principles of that were used. Um, the Quaker tradition also um, has a history of using modified consensus. And so I think it's a growing, um, I guess, body of decision making uh, or a approach to decision making. But uh, whereas, you know, I think the history of majority decision making probably goes back to Greece and kind of earlier principles of democracy or <laughs> representation and all that. But um, so I don't have a direct historical. Uh, <laughs> answer to you, for you, but we went to Google. <laughs> <laughs> I love Auntie Google. <laughs> okay. Andrea. Um, okay, so uh, full disclosure, I am a meeting facilitator in part of my professional life. I've been doing that for 20 years, and which seems all, almost impossible, but the math is accurate. Um, and I have worked with a lot of organizations that have used consensus, and here are my concerns. <laughs> um, First of all, most people end up voting. Like, just kind of that's how they feel they're making their decision. I vote for this thing. Um, so there's like a lack of ownership in this idea of like a true consensus decision-making moment is where you have resolved every concern that the group has in the moment. You have each come to that conversation without making up your mind about what outcome you want. And you agree together that the outcome that you've come up with is the best possible outcome that that group can achieve at that time. And I don't think you can, um, I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I think you can have a participatory decision-making process where you embrace a, a, a resolution on every concern that comes up and I hope that we'll do that in our committee work and here in these, in these meetings, um, and then resolve it with a vote. Um, and James, I appreciated you saying without being um, kind of pushed into the minority, um, which is certainly a thing that can happen in voting, that idea of winners and losers. But I think there's another component, um, which I've seen at play in group dynamics, which is that sometimes people feel pressured to come to agreement, even though they have true concerns. Um, they feel pressured to go along with the majority and lose the right to say publicly that they disagree. And so I don't think it's an automatic truth that using consensus um, truly resolves every concern or re resolves every power dynamic. I think that they are really important there are places where it's critical. And I think um, when your life is on the line, for example, or your livelihood is on the line or your family's well-being is on the line, you should take the time to like really sit in conversation and circle and resolve everything and come to agreement, trust and believe that each person is there in the spirit of crafting a new unique resolution in that moment and staying until it's done. Um, but I don't, actually think that's where we are. Um, not that I don't trust that each of us is here to create the best possible solution, but I think that like deep trust iteration thing, I don't, especially not on our current timeline, thank you, Sam, um, I, don't, I don't know that we have that. Um, and the other thing is we've already made a decision in this meeting not following consensus and I think that that's an easy thing to fall into. And if you vote, it's clear. It's done, it's decided, and it's in the minutes. And I will say from the standpoint of really wanting to protect this beautiful project that we're embarking on together, 
I just want it to be really clear that we've made a decision together. I want it to be like absolutely 100% documented in the minutes that it's been decided. And that there's no question, we all know we made a decision. That is my long rambly thing. But I will just end by saying, I think we could have a decision making process that says, we work together in conversation to resolve concerns, we strive for consensus, and decisions are made by majority vote. Like, they are not mutually exclusive. That's a lot of opinions. I'll be quiet. Robin, and then Michael. Yeah, I think, um, you know, reflecting on when the initial four or five, five of us, I think, uh, did the first vote, um, I like to say it just felt right to go with a consensus, right? Given the, the spirit of PCEF and, and the five of us was there, it just, that felt right in terms of picking the, 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 the other, or selecting the other four for members. Um, so uh, just want to state that for those of you who weren't there, it, it, in the moment, it, it, it felt right. And uh, so that's one comment. Um, I think uh, another, and I'm just going to be kind of rambling off various other comments. I think uh, for me, um, I'm, I'm okay with the consensus model for where we are right now at this stage in the implementation. Um, we don't know what the grant making process is or the framework of, of that. And so I like, if we move forward, I like to reserve that decision when we have a better idea of what the grant making process is. So maybe there is another method for decision making when we're actually coming to grant making. Uh, but for the implementation, all these committee works and everything like that, um, I think there is, you know, some benefit of, of getting the, the consensus. I uh, share with some of the concerns and thoughts that, that you have that I didn't really think about at the time, but I was like, yeah, that, that could happen. Um, and then the last comment that I'll say is, it was a group of five of us, I think, I forget the term terminology, but one person can uh, say no and the, the initiative is turned down. And that was, I think, fine for a group of five. Um, if that's something that we go forward with, I just want to put it out there is, is it fair for one person to now say no to something that eight other people support. Uh, and I think that's giving that one person a very strong voice. So, you know, maybe instead of making one um, required to have two people or maybe three people dissent um, before, before something is turned down. So I'm not 100% sure how I feel about that, but I'm just concerned that having one person having the voice of a no when everybody else says yes um, I think there's something not fair about that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I'll just quickly respond because the, in the kind of modified consen consensus model, it does allow for one dissenting voice or a number of dissenting voices to be present and have a blocking vote, but it not actually block the decision. So that's kind of the, the nuance there. Yeah. yeah. Michael? Um, I was going to, I, I just listened to Robin, and um, I have to say that me personally, during our last vote, when we were a committee of five, I left um, very dissatisfied with. Um, so I had a very opposite experience from Robin. Um, I was actually, I left and I was, um, yeah, I felt, uh, it felt like it was um, a hurried and rushed and semi-forced sort of or very forced um, form of consensus um, uh, due to time constraints, right? Um, so I, I I really want to thank Andrea for her for her insight into this. Um, I haven't worked in consensus in a long time, um, but um, yeah, I think that um, I think that with our time constraints, consensus can kind of be, I, I think from my singular experience with it so far on this committee, it can be very kind of pushed and rushed and forced into acceptance, like to forced into being pushed through. Faith. So Michael, would that have been alleviated by a majority vote? Would you have still felt rushed into making a decision that wasn't satisfying? That's, that's my concern. I, I'm reacting to this white supremacist culture that we live in that 
is driven by very def definitive timelines and how part of our job as PCF grant committee is to really push against and discover new ways, or not new ways, old wise ways of reaching consensus. So I really appreciate, Andre, what you said, and I wonder, can we build in time to actually have consensus? Sam, do you want to give the update on the timeline and agenda now? <laughs> so, so might as well move to that we need, we need, okay. Yeah. I think. Is everybody so, okay with that? So take, it, sort so, of take a break from this conversation. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I, it's certainly. Um, I, I appreciate all the comments. Um, this is Sam Brasso, uh, for the record. Um, you know, it's uh, the timelines and the pressures of timelines are are going. They they are unfortunately not going to go away. And it's 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 a reality that um, we need to we need to sit with and, and challenge and push when those timelines are real, where those are coming from, and I will do you know we will do our best to to elaborate on those and what we can um, the, the benefit of slowing down and, and and then where 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 we may need to think through some of that. And so I, I don't want to um, I don't want to hear those comments. I think during the last committee we presented a timeline that was aimed at getting dollars out the door in 2020 to invest in the sorts of innovative projects and programs that we haven't seen before in addition to those that we have. I mean, it was a timeline that was developed in full recognition that there would be significant learning and adaptive management in response to priority community needs. It's also a timeline that was, you know, that, that, that acknowledged the city council, the PCEF coalitions, as well as what we'd say is the broader public's desire to see awards funded as soon as possible. We passed the measure in November 2018. We're a year out from when that measure passed. Um, and we will be a year from now when we hopefully get to award dollars. At the same end, um, there is an element of the path that we are charting here today and moving on into the future that will be we ha where we haven't gone before. We, we can't necessarily just pick up roadmaps of other programs that have been developed within the state and leverage those. And so there's an element of learning that we are in some ways, we're going to have to create room for to learn, um, but uh, I, 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 will, I, will, I will always try to see that we hold that space to learn and adapt, and, and I think that's, that's, that would be my ask to the committee is that we hold and create that space so that we can do that, and fortunately, you all are here for four years. I hope each of you are here for at least four years, and then, to, and then, and then your second term so that we can see that learning through. Um, at the same end, we heard pretty clearly from you all you'd like more time and opportunities uh, to, to, to then those identified to engage intentionally with the development of the program. We heard those concerns and we reflected that more time would be equally beneficial to our team as well in developing content to support you all um, in making necessary and thoughtful decisions uh, so that we can make sure we're delivering on the promise to the residents. So we've connected, I mean, this is, it's imperfect, and this is an evolving, I hope it's an evolving conversation. We've connected with a handful of uh, stakeholders, including city council offices, PCF coalition members, to explore the implications of building in more time to tease out the grant committee criteria. We're talking in the range of six to eight weeks. This is still talking about moving pretty aggressively fast, but this is with the aim of announcing awards within 2020. Um, acknowledging that, that that initial pool of awards, I want to just bring a reminder that it's, it's $68 million, which is a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of the program, it is also a small pool of dollars. Um, so we'll be coming back to you all, and I, I know that we are over time, but key to meeting some of those needs that I think we've been hearing as staff have been doing outreach have been getting out capacity building resources. So in one of our, subs in some of our subs subsequent meetings, we will be talking about the various plans we've identified to get capacity building resources out within the community so that we can build capacity over time, recognizing that where we want to go and the constituents that we want to apply for these funds in 10 years, are, are it's going to look a whole lot different than it's going to look in year one, and we're going to need to think strategically over time what that looks like. We'll also plan to present... Um, We'll also, as we'll discuss next in the work session, we'll just talk about how we can work with each of you all in developing our agendas, as well as designing our discussions so we can leverage your areas of expertise. Um, so what we'll, I, I, I don't want to forestall the next discussion. I want to keep at least uh, keep this as, uh, keep my comments as brief as possible. But um, what we hope to discuss in the next work session is ways in which we can both effectively leverage your expertise while allowing staff to develop the content for you all to respond to. Um, so I'll, 
I know we're a bit over, so Katie, I'm going to so you. Just a couple of little pieces of clarification, one on decision making and one on the timeline. I think the um, on the timeline, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, 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 the short of it is um, Sam bought us six to eight additional weeks. So in, in terms of when we need, when, what our sort of target date is to get the RFP out the door, which is not a whole lot of breathing room, but it's a, it's a little bit of breathing room. And that was the result of talking with staff and in all of the council office and the mayor's office and with coalition members and folks in the community who have an expectation. Um, so that's one thing. And then on the decision making, I would say just, just um, to make sure that everybody is aware that um, the default for public bodies by statute is ma majority of whoever is present as long as there's a quorum present, which is half of you plus one. So, um, you know, there's, there is this sort of consens modified consensus that we had been using before, which, you know, tonight would be seven people kind of going along or supporting and one person blocking. It could all, it, which is not very far away from something like a two-thirds majority. Um, Janet, did you have something to add? Just, if I heard you correctly, Andrea, there's a, you're teasing, pulling apart this difference between the way we're making decisions and a commitment to a process, and then what's the number? Because even, James, what you're presenting as far as a number being, it could be two dissents. They're not blocks because it's not a block, so a dissents. And so I'm wondering if that's one of the things you're wrestling with is what's the piece of we want to have a way to hear concerns, come up with an alternative to address the concern, offer a new proposal, and, and have that deliberation, and so maybe one piece is how many rounds are we willing to do because it can't go on forever. And that when's the port part where we get to a vote and what's the number that feels comfortable? It needs to be six, it needs to be. So I think I just wanted to offer, I think what I'm hearing, some of the different things people are raising and maybe look for a different way, pa a different path for you to reconcile that. Grand piece? Oh, sorry. Did, Megan, did, did you have it? Someone's got to go. <laughs> 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 I, I think my comment is somewhat similar to Janet's, but just going back to what Andrea raised is um, I actually think that there's a, yeah, I think that we've sort of talked around a, like a hybrid approach that I think could work for us where we use the spirit of consensus but use a more traditional majority for simple numbers and I'm just wondering if like kind of adopting some community agreements might help us stick to that spirit of consensus and remind us about it so I was just jotting down like I think Andrea had suggested some language like yeah that we're committed to hearing concerns and we'll kind of build that in a structure um, where we ourselves would respect kind of dissenting opinions and like learn from that um, making wise use of our own voice so that we don't like hog mic time which I'm doing right now uh, and accepting that like rushed timelines are just a reality and it's a positive reality in this particular case because we want to fund amazing projects so I feel very comfortable feeling rushed for that goal um, and I just there's like never a reality where a decision doesn't feel kind of like I don't know there's just that's just a common reality and I'm okay with that um, so I just wonder if like maybe having some agreements around those might help us balance the like spirit of consensus but then a more practical um, 6-3 sort of majority voting. I, I would feel comfortable with that myself. Grand Fees. Yeah, I think regardless, it sounds like regardless which path we take, um, it's going to feel rushed. Um, I think I'm more concerned about just the quality of how we take votes. So I think regardless which path we take, whether we're um, consensus model or majority vote. Uh, I, would, I just want to make sure that, you know, the quality of experience for all members here in the committee, uh, that it's transparent ahead of time when there's going to be a decision to be made. Um, making sure that it's a clear vote count or a clear temperature check, whether we're doing a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways, like as a value that just makes sense. You know, I think at the same time, I want to make sure that, you know, 
that I think we were talking about values as we're making uh, any of these considerations as we're coming into conflict. We've already discussed what our values are and how we're staying mission focused uh, and can resolve some of these conflicts. I think we're gonna be, regardless in each of these models, there's gonna be conflict. We're gonna have to find a way to resolve this. Um, and I think the more that we can flesh out some of our values and mission, I think that'll help us sort of resolve some of these conflicts as they come up. Um, and that's gonna have to work in a consensus model. And even if we have to make it like a majority vote, I know personally, like I'm gonna wanna make sure that I understand why someone voted no um, regardless. Um, so I think, you know, and I think so, I'm, I personally feel comfortable in a consensus or a modified consensus model, knowing that we have a majority vote um, as a fallback based on statute. Like it, seem, it sounds like it's there regardless. So I, I just wanted to sort of note how I'm feeling about that. And I just wanted to note that I, for me, I think bottom line, what matters is just sort of the quality uh, and making sure that all votes or consensus, like it's captured clearly uh, on the notes. And I think for voters uh, and the general population, like I think being able to know why we voted and how we voted uh, and who voted and when really matters uh, and when folks on this committee are absent. So I think I just wanted to sort of note that and I think it's really important as a matter of transparency and public accountability. And maybe I'll just jump in and respond that yes, that's also very important to us as staff that we clearly understand both the concerns and the definitive outcomes and vote counts or temperature check, whatever we want to call it, um, so that we can know with certainty what decision is made moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, but we'll be able to provide those resources and the notes and the, the counting of votes um, moving forward. Andrea and then Maria. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm very happy to move with the, the group on this and if consensus, modified consensus feels like the decision making process that works, I will put out a request that at no point have I heard an explanation of what a block means. Um, and I think I would need a little more for myself, I would need a little more clarity on what that decision-making tool is and why it would be used by a member of the group. And maybe I'll just briefly respond. In my understanding and research, a, a block would be in a kind of full consensus model, a- It would be a veto. It, it would be a veto power. In a modified consensus block, there really isn't, or modified consensus model, there really isn't a block, there's just a no or a dissenting vote, and then a number of dissenting votes are still acceptable. So a part of it might, might be come down to what we call that no vote or dissenting vote on a proposal, um, but we probably, if it were modified consensus, we wouldn't call it a block vote because it wouldn't functionally be blocking it from moving forward. So hopefully that helps. I'm still getting familiar with the language myself, so. Maria. I don't have a strong preference for any model at this point, but I really appreciate the discussion. Um, what I do care most about though is that when um, people like Michael are having like concerns or tensions in real time, I hope that the space was um, adequate or safe enough for you to speak up because I, I can really sense like what you were feeling and I can resonate with that. What I care about is that we know what options we have and what timeline we have and what urgency is in front of us to make decisions because I remember like my light bulb go off in the city council meeting when Commissioner Hardesty was like, why don't y'all just leave a blank space? <laughs> and I, that was like my moment of realization where I thought, damn, we didn't even know that was an option or um, we understood the urgency at the same time. So I felt like, okay, this is why we all went for it. We were just like, okay, go, go, go. But um, in any moment, we definitely lean on staff and other peers, whoever, to let us know like all the options we have at the table so that we can make the most informed decision. Because I, I, I know what Michael's feeling and I appreciate you for speaking up right that, about that right now. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm here with all of you and I, love what you all are sharing. It 
it's really shedding so much light on how we're going <laughs> to decide moving forward. I love seeing you all think, and it's just been an honor to share that space today. This is this is Sam Rosa here. Um, I uh, I think um, what I just want to share uh, real quick, and in, in part in response to that, because I, I appreciate that, because I think I don't think I fully came back to M M Michael at least your point in saying I think what I said is there's going to be urgency, and I don't I think that discounts what you're saying, Michael. What I I think this is this is absolutely a learning process on our end as well, um, and I, I I'd say we we do as best job to, to as, as, as your staff in this to um, to read the landscape um, and and at times it's 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 imperfect uh, absolutely imperfect and and some of that certain that some of that uh, I'd say the urgency came from a few places but absolutely city council was one of those um, and so when I uh, I think there's reflections within the team of what it would mean to what it would what it would have meant had we had we slowed things down. So those were reflections we had within the team as well. And um, I, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's we will learn, <laughs> we will learn together. And I, I hope that we can acknowledge those. And so Michael, I, I apologize that I didn't fully necessarily address your comment when I came back and responded to it. Yeah. And please. Is it worth doing a temperature check with everyone to see where everyone is on whether it's modified or majority, just really curious where everyone, what the fin, where folks are at at this at this moment. And if we could do that verbally, that would be great. Just because we're recording it, so it is a lot easier for us to get accurate minutes. So, if we do that, can we define the modified thing just so we all have the same understanding of it? Mm -hmm. Just since I'm not, sh we've talked about like different iterations of it. And Maybe to be very specific, because a modified consensus does involve some number of uh, dissenting or no votes. If people could state what number, if we're if we're talking about modified consensus, if people could state what number of no votes they'd be comfortable with. Maybe that would be a useful centering of the process or model that we might arrive at. Does that sound helpful? Does everybody understand that? The, do request? people know what I mean? Okay. Are you saying the amount of no votes that we can we can have and then still go forward? Yep. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So I think Grand Peace, you get to start since it was your, it was your idea. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, I think it's going to feel like, like an arbitrary number at this point. Um, but I think you know I think if we're a body of nine. I would say any anytime we're like, you know, I think approaching two, three, that's a clear, I think, worth having a discussion how we resolve what's what's bubbling up for folks. Megan, you wanna go next? Oh, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go. We, we don't we don't get to have a, a voice in this, so Megan? We'll go this way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable voting just because I don't have a, or a temperature check, I guess. I really could go with whatever the group is sort of coalescing around. That's why I didn't want to go second. <laughs> um, I guess, as I said earlier, I'm sort of comfortable like bringing the spirit of consensus, but landing on a majority or a consensus with something around seven, two or six, three, I guess, if I'm gonna just say something that has some numbers by it, but I'm pretty open to hearing other people's thoughts. <laughs> Um, I'm a pretty strong advocate of a participatory democracy process that uses a supermajority voting. Um, and if we want to call that consensus uh, minus three, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Maria? I was trying to Google something around the math around this. It's been too long since I've taken statistics, but um, I, I'd say ditto with what Andrea said. Um, I'm leaning towards modified consensus with two votes. Yeah, I'm really committed to consensus, uh, but not for how we record the votes with the language that was used in the model that was proposed. So I think that lands me in squarely in Andrea's camp in the way she proposed that. Um, and 
Uh, two feels right to me as well, although I think we have to account for there being absentees. Uh, so I wouldn't want it to be more than three counting absentees, mm. meaning mm -hmm. that six of us have to agree okay. on something to go through. And I, I would also want us to just have some understanding. I love the idea of having principles that guide us and some understanding that we're gonna go around with each vote and actually state what it is and why it is and that you know, we'll have a couple of rounds of that to actually try to reach consensus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I'm in general agreement with what Andrea said. I think um, from a simplicity perspective, majority minority is just easy to understand, right? Uh, I'm still sometimes confused <laughs> about consensus. So um, I'm kind of in favor of, of some type of super majority, uh, whether it's two or three. Um, uh, I think just that's from a voting perspective is, is simple to understand. Um, uh, to the degree that um, we can ensure there's a conversation and people are able to speak their voice of opinion and, and state why they are for or against and have that dialogue for consensus, I think that, that would be very important just to have pick that, allow for that dialogue to happen um, in addition to the vote. Um, my, I, I'd like to start with, um, I think that two or three is just fine. I would aim towards three, um, because I feel like three gives you the opportunity to say, no, I don't really agree, even in the end, but still be okay with it going through. Um, I also think that consensus to me says that you go back and discuss it. Whereas a two-thirds majority means the bill failed, right? It's over and done. It doesn't go back for discussion um, after a vote. And so I like the consensus model because you can say you can have three dissents or three, three no votes and say, okay, let's, let's talk about this again. What are the concerns, right? Which, you know, Robert's Rules of Order is like, nope, it's over. Sorry, we're not revisiting that this now, you know? And so I think it, that consensus feels like it gives the opportunity to revisit um, problems within the decision that people are having. Um, and I feel like three gives op it does give the opportunity to be like, um, I, I think my consensus vote last time was a yes but I wanted it to be able to say, no, I don't agree, but I would have been fine with the outcome. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, I, th I feel like three, if you have three of those, I think if you have three dissents, it needs to go back for discussion. Did you have something, Sam? Well, I, Sam and I were just kind of looking at the uh, reflection from you all, um, and it seems like something came up that Faith mentioned, which was around absentee, or I think that was Faith, um, and perhaps that we're, in the math that we were all doing, that if we arrive at a solution where six people have to agree, that that then becomes that supermajority, um, acknowledging the potential for absences that would, yeah, um, so maybe I'm positively framing it that consensus means that six people agree in in the committee. No. Yeah. It's that. And I is, is that. that uh, Passing. Yeah. yeah. And that a consensus-based model of addressing the no votes is the process that we would use. That was okay. Doing the math. That seemed to be what. There were three thumbs up for the record. <laughs> Robin. But, but Robin no, no, I'm, I'm doing some. Yeah. Let me, let me Robin's pass. Robin's finger is up. Let me pass yeah. for now. I'm doing some math in my head. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> passing for a moment. Okay. Um, I would also just note that, I mean, the quorum can be defined. You guys can define quorum as long as it's more than um, half of you plus one. So oh, in this word. model, you would be def essentially defining quorum as six. So we wouldn't be able to hold a meeting unless there were six of you present or make a decision. We could hold a, me a meeting where decisions were not made. So the math I was doing in my head is, I mean, quorum, we can have from six 
we kind of have meetings from six to nine, and if we do this model where we need to have six approve a measure, is that fair? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I can't think fast in real time. <laughs> uh, Robin, say that again. Right, in this scenario, we have a meeting, right, and, and up to, we need a minimum of six, right. correct? Um, uh, but we can have all nine in the meeting. So at any, whenever we're doing any vote for anything, it could be anywhere from six to nine people involved. And if we have this kind of rule that says it needs six people to approve, is, is that fair in all those scenarios? What it is acknowledging, it may, it may, it, that, is, that is for you all to discuss. What it's acknowledging is that we are going to need to work really hard to make sure you, we have as many of you show up to the meetings so that we have that. That's, that's, that's the buy-in that we have in our meetings. So it's, it's, it's um, I trust I'm thinking through the same thing, but um, I, I think that what, what, it, what it does is it places an onus to have, um, to, to make sure that we, we do what we can, uh, everything that we can, uh, and, and that we structure our decision-making meetings um, very strategically. I'm not, I'm not convinced yet, but does anybody else have any thoughts along those lines? Faith, did you have something? I just wanted to place a comment on what Sam said, which is I think it really behooves us all to take it that seriously, and including the future of the program, right? But if we, we do need to be really strategic about those decision-making meetings, and we should all be there if we can. So, Not that life doesn't happen, of course. But, but oh, Just one, one thing briefly that I noticed is I don't, no, and we'd have to look at the bylaws of committees of the opportunity for votes cast through other mechanisms if people are not there present. Also, in the consensus model, it makes it a little harder to do pro any sort of proxy vote or absentee vote because the, that vote is not informed by the discussion. So that... Those I, are prohibited. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, that makes it easier then. Yeah, no. Is... Sorry, An Angela, hold on one second, Michael. Was there someone on the phone? No, but I'm wondering if uh, committee members can phone in to participate. Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, you can participate telephonically, but you cannot vote by proxy and you can't send in a vote. Thank um, you, Katie, for <laughs> knowing the rules better. Michael? Sorry, you got distracted. That was Angela's fault. <laughs> um, I was I was going to say that um, also along with with how we make how we make decisions, our decisions it feels like on the uh, in this committee are going to be an ongoing and living decision making process. So if we make a decision one day, and six months later it's not working, we are not stuck with that decision. Right, so I think that's an important thing to also remember is that um, as, as, the, as PSEF grows, um, as the fund grows, as the community grows, as things change, um, that we will obviously have the opportunity to change things that aren't working, uh, try new ideas, um, and we aren't, a, a final vote of six is not a, is, is not a permanent decision. That's a very good point. Megan? I was just going to say something in response to Robin's, I think, concern that um, if we set a number at six minimum and we have six and it requires a 100% vote versus a 66% vote if all nine of us are here, we could create a, like a scaled number. It could be six if we have full attendance, but five if seven or if six or seven. You know, we could. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> Ryan, please. Just a point of clarification. Regardless of what we decide, by default, we're st we still have the majority and minority vote. It, it, well, if you don't decide, you can vote by simple majority. No, I mean, so my, my question is like, so say we hear, we decide consensus. Mm -hmm. And say like the, we take the extreme end of consensus model, like one vote is a blocking vote. Say it's not working we can just, you know, by def because it's already in the statute we, uh, or sort of uh, the bylaw template, we could say, look, this isn't working. You know, we're already like two hours over time. 
let's take a majority uh, minority vote. I, I think I, no. I, I don't. Yeah. My my, my, no. my understanding. Point of clarification. Yeah. <laughs> I I am I am trying to remember the exact content of the bylaw template, but I believe that it's a sort of a choice of simple majority or an alternate process that is defined by the committee. Um, and so it's not, it's the default, but it still needs to be incorporated into the bylaws um, and the decision-making process that is decided on in the bylaws is what governs the, the committee. I think I'm, I'm, I'm seeing nods from Angela, who knows? Yeah, I think there's one no. little clarification there, which is that you can operate without bylaws. Yeah. I mean, you probably shouldn't for very long, but but you can. And if you do, then but then you can make decisions by simple majority, unless you, as a group, decide to do something that is sort of greater than, is a bigger hurdle than a simple majority. You're not allowed to choose something that is less than a simple less than a simple majority. Um, you can amend bylaws. So if you you know made a decision that you wanted to go with a sort of consensus minus three and you put that into the bylaws and then six months later you decided that that wasn't working, you could have just amend your bylaws and then you would have a new way in there. But the bylaws uh, do create transparency so that the public understands how you're making decisions so that future you know governing bodies understand what they're getting into. Um, but, but you would have to use the decision-making structure you agreed upon to amend your bylaws. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's a little chicken and eggy. So um, I wouldn't mind taking, we, we are over time, and in the interest of um, trying to respect everybody's uh, sort of conversation and process around this and not wanting and and wanting to come to some resolution tonight because we have um, so many other things so not trying to rush anyone <laughs> again but just gonna do it um, I I would like to kind of um, go around and hear and just s take another temperature and and see how folks would feel about what is essentially a modified consensus process with a more formal vote where a supermajority is required to pass things, regardless of, um, of the number, so not a scaled supermajority, but like six, so two-thirds majority. Um, that's, what I thought I, that's what I thought I heard from, the, from most of the people who talked, that they were kind of open to that. Is that clear? I think the one kind of remaining question there is a supermajority vote is usually like that term is a supermajority of people present. Right. And what I think is being described is a supermajority of committee members. That's what I think I heard described as well. Yes. Just to make sure that. So we will not use the word supermajority anymore. We'll just say two thirds majority, absolute majority, not of people present. Maybe we'll start on this side this time. <laughs> Megan? I do support that motion or whatever oh, it's I called. I didn't make a motion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I would entertain a sliding yeah. one, but I, yeah. I'm fine with that as you described it. <laughs> um, I'm also fine with that. And I also want to say this conversation is giving me a lot more confidence in the group's ability to use a consensus process where we address concerns, so thank you for that. I'll roll with it, too. <laughs> I'm okay with it as well. I'm in. I, I like the two-thirds. Uh, I'm not convinced of whether it should be of people present or of the whole committee. Um, just because life happens and, and it doesn't seem, I'm just, maybe I'm just more used to, um, you know, a vote of the people present. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I don't have a strong feeling about it, but I'm just kind of putting it out there that I have some reservations about two thirds of the people present versus two thirds of, um, the whole committee, but I like two thirds. Um, I 
like the two-thirds vote, um, and I also hear Robin's concerns about six people showing up, making quorum, and voting with three people absent. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of uh, would like, like it to be two-thirds who are present, but I'd like, like to hear from other folks, um, again, if that's how they feel. Because um, I think I heard two-thirds yes, but uh, it was unclear whether two-thirds present or two-thirds as we're currently constructed. Faith, would you like to, you were the one who sort of made that distinction initially. Um, so if we had a quorum would be five, and we went by a two-thirds vote, three people could decide. <clears throat> that does not seem like enough to me. Oh, thank you. Yes, I think you're right. We have to be four. The two-thirds of the committee would mean that, I mean, you can still decide. You haven't decided what quorum is, but you would need six people voting in the affirmative to make any decision. So you would need to have at least six people. So meaning that if you only have six people there, let's say that a quorum at the minimum needs to be five, but let's say you decide, and let's just assume quorum ends up being five, you need to have at least six people to vote, and you need to have one, if it's only six people that are in attendance, meaning you still have greater than quorum, then you need 100% of folks in attendance voting affirmatively. If only five people are there, you can still hold the meeting, but you can't make any decisions. On the current proposal. On, on that's right, right, exactly, right, right, right. Exactly. Not, that's not required. That's either. exactly. Right. So, Ranfis and then Andrea. I guess with that said, I feel like it depends on the level of the decision. So I think it, I would say like a bylaws, maybe two thirds of the committee as constructed, depending on the level of the of the of the decision being made. Two thirds present just seems pretty practical. I lost you on that. So so uh, so two thirds present for simple decisions. I'm going to quote that simple. And then <laughs> oh. anything that requires. <laughs> now let's all define simple. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah. I, guess, I guess the distinction for me is if there's going to be a bylaw change that, that feels like to me that's pretty, uh, would require maybe like two thirds of how it's current. Sorry, any, any bylaws change, bylaw changes or uh, as we're constructing a bylaws, I feel like two thirds of the committee, of all full nine members, makes sense. Depending, I think, on the level of uh, the des other decisions being made that aren't bylaws related, I think two thirds still seems pretty practical for who are present. Can I make a friendly amendment that's maybe a... Uh... Sure, can we... Oh, answer? sorry, I think yeah, had a comment. Sorry. Um, I was gonna say, I think we can address some of these concerns by making the quorum six instead of five. Um, and then have it be a two-thirds majority decision of people present. Like, so we just agree that we can't make a decision unless six of us are sitting in the room with a proposed agenda in front of the public, um, and that at least two-thirds of the people have to agree to that decision. Faith? My amendment wasn't quite that one, but I'd go for that. My amendment was it takes five to vote on, vote anything up. So that's a majority of regardless of who's present, right? Mm -hmm. But to, to make an approval that five people would have to agree to it, which is the majority of us. But So two thirds, if, there, if a quorum is six and two thirds of those present have to vote, then then that's four. four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay. Let's go around the room one more time. Can you can you state the proposal? <laughs> a cl 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 yes. State okay. the proposal. Yeah. <laughs> so, using a consensus process or a participatory um, process and um, making sure that people's 
Concerns are addressed and noted, Things will, but decisions will be made by vote with a two-third majority of those present and a quorum is defined as six committee members. A voting quorum. Mm -hmm. Ranfis? Uh, I will pass to hear from other folks. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I'm a little reluctant. I liked uh, with face initial a proposal where you need it five to make it go through. I'm a yes to the proposal that's on the table. Yes. I'm a yes. Yes. Can we, can we clarify? I, I want to make sure that we're we're clear about the, so we so the subsequent folks that voted yes, Faith, Rob, and Michael Ranfis. This is the proposal that uh, Jeffrey you just modified. Which okay, um, we're gonna <laughs> we will come back to that. Um, so this is that there is you need to have a minimum of five. I don't I don't believe so. This is the bomb. Yeah, that was. So the proposal that was on the table gotcha. was two thirds of those present with a quorum of six. six. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which means four out of five can make it go through. That's correct. Right. Yeah. And, we, and so that was what you were currently voting on. And what mm -hmm. was on, the, and correct me if I was wrong, Faith, your initial one was we have to, it has to be a minimum of five mm -hmm. at all times, right? My modified initial you one. Yes. modified <laughs> initial one, yeah. Yes. But I think we were all voting on a quorum of six. If a quorum yes. of six, yes. <clears throat> so. Andrea, did you still have a comment or is your yeah. card just flipped up? Okay. Yeah. Michael? Are we still using our original consensus with one defense from previous to make this decision? We can make this decision. I mean, th this decision can be made by default with a simple majority. And so uh, if I think that we, if, but we could also make it using the default that which anything greater than a simple majority. So we could note um, Jeffrey's desire to have five members to be able to pass uh, any, make any decisions or pass any motions and, um, but go with the proposal that the rest of you voted on, which is that a quorum is six and two thirds of those present need to vote in favor of something to have it passed. Does anybody else have anything that they would like to say or any comments? Can I ask Jeffrey a uh, question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> how strongly do you want five? Um, I'm, I'm willing to, I'm willing to go for. I just want to voice my concern that I think you know we should have five out of the nine at all times. So I'd rather it be if we have six people present, five out of the six are, are making that decision and for it to go forward, just so. I just think it's with with, uh, with when it comes to four out of six, it's just to me it doesn't feel like it's enough. It should be more. It should be really close to a consensus when we only have six people there. And That's, maybe just to reflect on that briefly, if I could. so your concern, Jeffrey, if I'm hearing it correct, is that if it were four in, in the six-person uh, quorum, if it were four, then that would actually be a minority of the total nine that would be. Passing yeah. something. Yes, that's so that's concern. that's your concern. Yes. So I'm seeing kind of a decision tree of sorts in a proposal that would be minimum five votes required, minimum six people for a quorum, mm -hmm. and then as long as that five a minimum five is also upheld, then a two thirds majority vote or majority con consensus. Mm -hmm. That would satisfy, I think, all the th three elements we've talked about, and the only, and five out of seven would would be two thirds majority. So the only situation in which that kind of five would be invoked would be if there were only six people. Yes. Okay. Megan, Andrea, and Megan, yeah. did you still have something? No. And uh, then, go oh. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if anybody, I'm, I'm, I'm open. Like I said, I'm not 
super strong on that. Just kind of have my gut feeling on that. So if, you know, if everybody if you want to add anything, I'm I'm open to hear people's perspective I, on it. Um, I I think uh, I, th I think a couple of things. One is if we continue to have robust conversations where we work through people's concerns and come up with the best possible decision, the way we make the decision doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's my like fundamental belief about how groups can make decisions best. It doesn't matter how you decide, it matters how you have the discussion. Um, and the second thing is I'm concerned about making a decision-making process that's so complex we might accidentally not follow it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, oh, sorry to reflect briefly, I think it's possible to have a pretty clear tree for that decision following what Jeffrey proposed. But. Well, let me ask, is everybody still standing, is that where they, everybody still want to do the four six? even after me voicing my concerns? If so, then I'll, I, I will concede. Go ahead. That was, I saw you had a calculator, James. I was doing the math. And recognizing your concern that four, which is not a majority of us, could pass, thinking about it that way does make me prefer your suggested modification, which I don't think is too confusing. I think if we added much more, it might get a little unwieldy. But as of right now, I feel like I've already got it in my head. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's as simple as a two-thirds majority with a quorum of six, but not less than five, mm -hmm. yes. right? So yes. always know we need five. That sounds like a motion. <laughs> That's a motion. Okay. Second. I uh, believe. <laughs> okay. Ramfis. Sorry, can you clarify again what the motion is? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about. Uh, uh, we will definitely we, make a poster. Yeah. Well, we have, <laughs> yeah. Do we have markers? Do you really want it again? Okay. So a quorum of six to make a decision, two-thirds majority vote to pass an action, but not less than five. And mm, I would just add maybe to address your concern, Andrea, we as staff can clearly articulate at the beginning of a decision-making process how many votes are, ne are needed. Um, that's something we can easily do at the beginning of the process. That will help a lot. Yeah. So, Ranfis, are you ready to give it? He gave a thumbs up. Uh, yeah. This one. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, yay! <laughs> I do just want to say we reached consensus on our voting decision making you process. <laughs> okay, so we have 12 minutes, guys, <laughs> for our work session. Um, so I think we're probably just going to skip it and, in lieu of that, follow up with. Um, each of you individually about areas of content on the agenda that you'd like to um, work with staff to develop and flesh out kind of um, based on your expressed interest, your area of expertise, your experience. And so we'll, um, we'll send that message out probably by the end of the week, um, Hopefully, hopefully sooner than later. We've got kind of a big week this week, but um, but definitely by the end of the week. And then we will try and have a, a more compressed work session to do some of the subcommittee, kind of like creating some subcommittees and assigning folks to some subcommittees. I mean, you all will do the assigning with your new voting technique um, at the beginning of the next meeting. And I just want to add, I mean, I, I think as a, as a default basis, because it's important for us to be able to schedule these meetings out on your calendars, as well as start to get, be able to invite people and bring speakers in. It, it is just a challenging thing, both in terms of finding space and doing the logistics work. What we're going to opt for is we're, I know that in our, uh, in the, in the memo we sent out, we had two options, which was meeting two times a month as an entire subcommittee, as an entire committee versus once a month. We are going to go ahead and move with we're good, as far as getting calendar schedules, we're going to move with two meetings a month. And should that be dis, should that be changed, um, we will we'll, we'll respond. But I think as as a basis of just getting that time on your calendars, it's going to be important for us to be able to move ahead of that. So. Yeah. So we will also be sending out some doodle polls, and it will be it's it will be it's easier to cancel things than to add new ones. 
And just one final note coming full circle to the beginning. If you do feel like you want to provide a moment of inspiration at the beginning, bring something creative. It doesn't have to be a poem. It can be um, any, interpret that as, as you wish. Um, then yeah, feel free to reach out to us and we can put that on the schedule as well as we're planning these meetings. Okay, and my oh. final thought for the, oops, sorry, I Megan. have a question. Um, yeah. Since you're gonna be reaching out to us individually about like subcommittee work, I had a couple clarifying questions sure. about it. Um, you have you propose minutes. subcommittees around um, meeting and I'm curious if those can be phone call meetings. Yeah. Uh, and then another, you had something about members of the public engaging in the conversation at that table of subcommittee work and I was just curious what that would look like. Well, I think that the thought there was that if it was a smaller group of people, um, like if there was a subcommittee of two or three and you wanted to bring in like people with specific areas of expertise or areas of experience to help inform those decisions, that you could have just an, a more informal conversation. You could also, as a subcommittee, decide that your specific subcommittee holds a seat for a specific <coughs> person from a neighborhood or from an organization or whatever. So that was, that's what that was about. And sorry, one more clarifying point, but it says meetings will be open to the public. So is that similar to this, um, including if they were phone meetings, like work, work meetings? It would be an open line. Session. Yeah, those, that's just the requirement of the law. They would not be advertised as broadly because I just recognizing that there would be less interest and um, they would be happening with more frequency, but they would definitely be posted and available to the public. I think I I think you guys can just click through and pick the days that you are available and we'll go with whoever with the days that have the most. I do say I don't know how other people feel but in my ideal world we would land on a day that we stick to for a while. Mm -hmm. The like sh shuffling of weeknights is a bit more challenging in my schedule but I don't know if that's just me. I mean, we certainly, as staff, it would be nice to eventually to get to a place where we were like the second Tuesday of every month or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, so that we could kind of always have that um, set aside. It's hard to imagine we're going to find two of those days that are the same for everyone, but we, um, we can certainly try. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the challenge is just where we stand right now and given that we're scheduling for January, if we set a date, a set date that we could just miss an individual. And so it, it will, it may still be just a little clunky for another until we have a certain, a certain amount of clarity moving forward. So we'll, we'll come back um, and on the 16th, we'll check if we've got it close to right. <laughs> And just one more little announcement. Uh, you all should have Office 365 accounts, and so we will not be printing material for the meetings anymore unless we are re specifically requested by you to do that. Faith? So there's a community meeting on Thursday, the 5th, and do you have five committee members already signed up to go? We have four, and that's the max. Four is the max, yeah. and you have that, great. Mm -hmm. And then there was the celebration as well, which is maybe next weekend, or is I tomorrow? Just, or I tomorrow. think only one person has indicated that they're gonna go to the celebration. Yeah, that is, and, and, and that's tomorrow, just... uh, starting I think at 5.30 at the Sierra Club. Okay. So mm -hmm. only one person has indicated interest there, so there's room for at least three others. A, a follow-up to um, the participating in those sorts of public events. Do you have any advice on our particular role? It seems like we would not be acting like a regular attendee at like Thursday's event particularly. Do just like networking around grant making. And it yeah. It's like we wouldn't be playing a normal attendee role in that. I think June is the primary organizer of that fabulous event. Um, but I would say that, in, so if you have something to add, please, please do. But I think just hearing what people are t saying. Thumbs up from June. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Oh. All right. Well, the computer is telling us it's time to go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank we'll you see all. you next time. <laughs>